Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? All the Crow family, everybody watching. Welcome to Crowcast episode 36. 36, bro. That's incredible. 36 weeks. 36. Every week, I know we say that 34 weeks, 35, but it's impressive, man. The more it goes up, like, you know, it's, uh, it's it really wow. Is. It really is. And, and the guests keep coming. Uh, and tonight is, is incredible. We've got award winning. Uh, actor, producer, writer, Mr. Johnny Owen joining us very soon. Can't wait for that. So excited. Um, I know myself and you both watched The Three Kings um, on Amazon. Um, nice plug there for Amazon if they want to give us a free subscription. So um, <laughs> you've got to get them in. No, son, you've got to get them in. And um, yeah, and his work, obviously, with uh, Don't Take Me Home, um, Sven Gali. Um, it'd be cool to ask him all his other acting jobs and stuff that we mentioned as well. You know, his appearances in Shameless and yeah. um, Murphy's Law was here. And um, so, yeah. And I know he's working at Talk Sport, mate, which, you know, besides Planet Rock, um, is another station that I really, really do listen to. Like, you know? Yeah, man. It's, it's, it's amazing. And he's Welsh. <laughs> yes. To top it all off. Yeah, definitely that. How, how was your week, bud? Uh, busy one? or? Yeah, pretty busy. Um, it's almost like we keep seeing the same thing or busy with music, as you know. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, what we've been up to, and we have been busy. Um, I kind of can't, I can't wait to tell people what we've been up to. Yeah, but just know everybody that um, the crews are busy behind the scenes, and I'm sure we'll tell you exactly what's happening very soon. But um, I can see everyone, there's a lot of people joining us tonight, which is brilliant. What's happening, crew family? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, some some people are back in lockdown, aren't they? Even Scotland, um, are I think so. And I know England haven't come out of lockdown yet. Um, and don't forget, there is the big bake off as well. So it's the final tonight, apparently. So I know, like, you know, there's a lot of loyal and hardcore Crow fans who are like, you know, we'll be here for, from the start. Um, and we don't, there's no problem at all. I know there's a few people who are going to join us around quarter past nine um, because they just want to see the bake off final. Like, you know what I mean? So, yeah, it's never been the same for me. But as I said earlier, without Mary Berry, like, you know, since yes. since we got rid of her, but it's never been the same for me. Although I did a bit of baking this week, but oh, myself and the missus made a birthday cake. All it right. was, in, it was really good. I'm not going to toot my own horn, but we were quite proud. Of the outcome, it's a lot of pressure when you're doing a birthday cake. Like you know, you want it to be special, and especially in um in this environment now, there's no big parties or anything, so you want to kind of make it the best it can be. So so yeah, we uh, it was a total success. Did a bit bit of a unicorn cake with some cupcakes and stuff like that. But a what, lot of fun. Like a sponge cake, is it? Or? Um, it was a Victoria sponge filling. Sell it uh, to me. Sell it to me. Right, so it was a, a three-layer Victoria sponge, and why I up my game, and I will do you one. Actually, I will. I'll definitely do you a little Christmas cake, my boy. Um, <laughs> I did my own buttercream and um, my own icing and stuff like that. Like I've never, never done that. I, I've got to be honest. In the past, I've used the um, the the jars. Um, so you can just buy them ready-made devils or whatever they called. I can't remember, but um. But yeah, I've kind of been lazily doing that. But I looked up the right recipes, made my own icing mixture. Then about nine o'clock, we were doing the cake, and I went, "Hang on, I got a wicked idea." Exactly like when we're songwriting, I was like, "I got a wicked idea. I got a wicked idea." Drove to Tesco's with about an hour to spare um, to pick up two little food colorings because I had the idea of coloring the sponge cupcakes. So I did some of them pink, some of them light blue. Um, so it matched like um, when the missus did the the whole like the mane of the of the unicorn hair, it, yeah. it kind of matched matched the top. So yeah, not something that I would normally go into so much depth with, but it, you know that's that's kind of like <laughs> that's oh, where we are. Now. Show, You're on the wrong show. Today. I know. I, I should have been enough. I know that I should have. <laughs> I should have been enough. I know. But you know, thirty six. You know, weeks of crowcast. Um. And it kind of tips the hat off to the earlier episodes where, you know, even Shina was having a dabble um, at making donuts and um, and a lot of the Crow family were sending photos of cheesecakes and stuff like that, like, you know, so, yeah, um, yeah and and a lot of, like, love got to go over to the pie man, Gary and Helen. Um, I've been kind of watching their, 
they're cooking, which has given me tips as well. So it adds up my game, dude. It's like, but the sponge, my boy, it was soft and it was very moist. Very <laughs> moist. Because nobody wants a dry sponge, let me tell you. It has to be moist. Do you know what I mean? I'm salivating, son. You got me. You got me. That's it. I'd love to do like a, I don't you know. Add me at sponge. <laughs> love it. Love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to do some sort of like Christmas cake or something. So there we are. But your birthday your birthday is bloody Christmas, isn't it? It's like a Christmas yeah. birthday cake. So I'll do an half and half, like a yin yang cake. Yes. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, you and you're spiritual up. as fuck as well. So that's perfect. Like you're setting yourself up, yeah, but I'm expecting big things now. I can do it. Big things. It, it can happen. It can happen. Amazing. Well done, brother. Hey, um, man. Besides, I mean, we had a, we managed to have a, a kick around the other day, which was cool. Yes, we had a game of football on Sunday, which was amazing. We hadn't, well, I haven't kicked the ball in, it, actually, I was going to say eight months. Or, yeah. But we, had, we hadn't kicked the ball because of tour and that as well. Because that was in February. So, you know, my, my boy said that, but he he reckons that we didn't. He did. He reckons we didn't play this year. But I'm pretty sure. Didn't we have a game in January? We had to have had a game in January. But he remember. he was convinced that Christmas was the last time, like literally a year ago. And I was like, no. So we'll have to ask the boys that in the group and stuff. But um, yeah. oh yeah, it was just That's great to be running around. Um. Yeah. And, you know, I know, like, a lot of the Crow family might not be football fans, but we are, and it was just more the the activity of getting out and the the, the the team sport, and we are competitive. It's only a kick around at the end of the day, but we're very, very competitive, like, you know, so. Yeah, oh, we are. I'm just reading all these comments here. This, this is one. <laughs> I'm going to have to Alex scroll Mar through. Alex Marsh, best way to stay moist is, a, is with a Welsh accent. There we go. <laughs> we're here to please. <laughs> Oh, there we are. Alid's Alid's given the there we go. Well done, Alid. If is that a spoiler though? What if I someone was waiting to watch her? Oof. Well, this is going to be an audio version as well, so I didn't really say it. So go um on. for those who've been following us for 36 weeks, the crows are going full podcast as well. So um we're in the middle, it'll be actually ready, I think, very, very soon. Uh we're gonna be uh available on spotify and itunes as well um it'll be kind of a uh watered down version of the crowcast because it's very visual with some of the the video clips and stuff so we'll be kind of cutting it up um and doing an audible version so if anybody's going to work or they want to listen to any of the interviews uh with a couple of minutes then of us kind of rabbling on and in, you know introducing the episodes so or it's different but it's it's a new world isn't it as we keep saying now we're trying to be innovative and Exactly, but um, I'm I'm enjoying it. You know, it keeps us busy, doesn't it? And like a lot of people saying, keeping people sane. So all good. There we in go. Fact, there's our, there's our guitarist there. Um, what's David saying there now? He said, "Sorry, guys, I'm busy watching the Bake Off finals." Well, you can't be because you, you're texting us. He's exactly. Just for, he's just looking for. Ah, he's, unbelievable. <laughs> he's like, I oh, know. Yes, got on the beginning. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right, we've got some birthdays here. Let's start off with some birthdays. Cool. Um, it's not that many this week, actually, but we got Steve Parrish. Hi, guys. Could you please wish my wife, Angie Parrish, very happy birthday for Thursday, the 26th of November? It would mean a lot to her to get a birthday shout out. We always watch Crowcast, one of the highlights of the week. Ah, happy, happy birthday. birthday. Cheers, Steve. But Angie's quite popular because it goes on. Would you be able to wish our very good friend, Angie Parrish, a happy birthday for Thursday, the 26th of November. Thank you from Claire Duffin, Eileen, and Trevor Edwards. Got a lot of love there, Angie. Happy, happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday. We also got uh, Ben Watts. Happy birthday, Ben, <laughs> who was 14 on Saturday. Last from your mum and dad and all the Crow family. Happy birthday, bud. Happy birthday. And we got a shout out to you, Donna Griffiths. Has literally just got in touch and said, Can I please say thank you so much to Emma Ashcroft for the painting she has done for her? I don't know what painting it is. Ooh. But um, Emma's in ex extremely talented. So there we go. That's the shout out on birthdays. Love that. Seeing more uh, more comments by you. Everybody wishing the Crow family happy birthday. Um, oh, nice, nice hello from. Dude, there's, a, there's a blast from the past. There's old Die Boy. Down the front, 
Hey. How you doing, David? Yeah, very well, thank you. Very well. 36 weeks, we know how hard it is, buddy. So fair play to you, Naomi, uh, for keeping it going so long. It was uh it's definitely a hard week, and there's a lot more work that goes on behind the scenes to oh, yeah. it is, isn't it? any tips. Yeah, you'll have to give me a ring. We need some tips. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. Oh, they were yeah. Donna just said he was the picture of me. Oh, right. Oh, it was another one, was it? Oh, oh she done you a copy. I see. Ooh. Emma's just oh, like, yeah, I've got one of them, I've one of them, I've one of them. Amazing. Wish happy birthday. Oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah, I love that. 29. Oh, wow, was oh. it? 29 years ago today, Freddie Mercury passed. Wow. A uh, complete inspirational. Oh, unbelievable. What a front man. What a singer. But we're not bad. We're going up against Bake Off and we're going up against I'm a Celebrity. Yeah. Um, we have got Johnny's coming on shortly. Um, it won't be long. I, like I said, I'm really excited to speak to Johnny, especially um, to know how we felt about like Wales in the Euros. And mm. um, that's that's going to be cool chatting to him about that as well. And to even know, um, oh, there we are. There's a few people still saying about Freddie. 1991. I wonder if he's still living in Wales as well, Shane, or whether he's uh, if he's up country. I have no. I thought you were talking about Freddie Mercury then. No. <laughs> Is he still living in Wales? No. No. I'm not sure, but you you'd think so. God's country, eh? You know why would he leave? That's the way I see it. <laughs> and you're winning guys don't worry about the others i'm a celebrity is a bit shite this year i've been i've been i got to catch up there's a couple of episodes apparently i don't know shane ritchie kicked off a bit i haven't seen it yet so um uh the, the family are catching up on that and um I'll, I'll have a little look after the crow cast so we're a, we're a couple of days behind because we've been kind of flat out behind the scenes yeah. um there's been a lot going on um do we even made it into a cookbook this week buddy yeah, this is how um, cool is that? Brad Ma and the guys from uh, Massive have produced this <laughs> two carrots. They produced Massive. two carrots. Beer drinking, home cooking, rock and roll recipes. So that's they've they've done this book and his recipes in there, and they've basically um, teamed up every recipe with a band um, and a, a little sort of um, briefing about the band. And we're lucky to be in that book. What's yeah. our recipe? Oriental pork chop. You sent a copy. Um, it arrived today, which we can oh, have a little look at while we wait for old Johnny. Um, the cover is absolutely fantastic. A lot of work gone into it. Yeah. Smell. Got that new book. <laughs> that new book catalog smell like, do you know what I mean? Is um, your cake in there, son? Is your cake in there? Oh, man. That's brilliant. Uh, good day, you damn crows. Hope you're all keeping safe and rocking at a socially acceptable distance. We couldn't tour and we can't do anything for you, so we wrote a cookbook, a cook and roll cookbook. Hope you find a nice new dinner or two and find some new music while you cook. Congrats on all the continued success and hopefully see you at a gig sometime soon. Rock and roll, Brad, Ben, Andrew, Brenny. Massive. Ah, that's awesome. Thank you, boys. Ah, uh, that is amazing. I'm glad I opened it on you now because that's an absolutely stunning message. Um, let's have a look where we are then, Shane. Oh, let's see. We're, a, we're an oriental pork chop, I believe. We are an oriental pork chop. See, we got to keep it on topic. I mean, you got Bake Off on BBC yeah. One, is it? Is it BBC One now? Or they didn't they go to Channel Five or something? Or I thought it was BBC Two. I don't know. Oh, there we are. Oriental Pork Chop, page 45. Have a look, page sense. 45. Let's have a look at that. 43. 45. Is it, is it a scratch and sniff book as well? <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, Oriental Pork Steak it is. Oh. So, yeah, your recipe is there. I'm very clever. You can scan down the bottom in the bottom right hand corner, which is the code, and you can listen to Point of No Return while you're cooking. Wow. How awesome is that? It's amazing. Oh, it's on channel four now. That's what everyone's saying. No way. Is it? Oh, they proper sold out. No wonder Mary Berry left. Oh, they couldn't they afford it. 
And they're probably like, that fucking cake is awful on Channel 4, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> ah. Now, that'd be a cooking programme. That's why I love Ramsey so much, mate. I, yeah. I'm a massive fan of... Um, swearing. Uh, yeah, I'm <laughs> swearing. Um, thank you, guys. Absolutely incredible, that is. Uh, go go check it out. Uh, some incredible artists in here. Um, I don't want to look like it's all about the crows, so there's... There's everybody in here, I think. Um, V8 wankers. <laughs> the V8. I honestly, dude, you can't write it. That was that was literally the first page I turned to. The V8 wankers. Full uh, full pull baby. I am not making that up. Uh, <laughs> you can't. <laughs> Do you think I just made that up? I thought you just made that up. That's fucking brilliant. Isn't it? Revival sons. Great Western, uh, Valkyrie, uh, Goodbye June, Community Inn, um, Ragdoll, Back to Zero. So there's some great bands and some amazing um, artists in here as well. Smoking Martha. Um, but yeah, if you want a She Wolf, brilliant. Outstanding. Outstanding. Brad and the boys, thank you so much. That's wicked. Yeah. I appreciate that. But yeah, I, um, I love my old Ramsey with um, Hell's Kitchen as well. Yeah, yeah. That's a lot of that, though. Like, the American one in particular. That's the one, isn't it? Yeah? Yes. When he goes to America. Yeah. You, I don't know how much of that is actual, real, and it's just always... I find all the American stuff like that a bit sort of tongue-in-cheek, and is it real, and it's a bit sort of... Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, I watched one the other day, and he sent a cook home and left one guy there that I was just like, he's only there for TV. He ain't there for any other reason. It can't be like, you know, so because yeah. he's yeah. been, he's that one. Like, have you ever watched that series or? Yeah. Yeah. He's that guy who was fucking hopeless. All his teammate him. Um, you know, even Ramsey picks up on it and yet he still keeps him in there because he's good TV, like, do you know what I mean? So exactly. I think I know what you mean. He obviously, he knows there's about, you know, two or three guys or or girls who um who are like the winner or the potential winners. Then he's got his Sue Cooks, um, I think that's what you call her in there, um, who kind of man the kitchens, watch everything that's going on, um, and obviously dripping back stuff with without the the stuff that's kind of recorded. Um so yeah, he's just keeping some of them on for TV, like so Yeah, I think he is. I think he is. Yeah, definitely. What's the oh. What are they saying? But yeah, what book are the crows going to bring out? Beer tasting, home decor, top 10, top 10 of gig venue toilets. That's a really good one, that is, Gary. Yeah, I'm not into, I'm not into my beer. Dave is, isn't he? Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, I'm not really into beer. Whiskey, as you know, bourbon. Yeah. Wine. In, oh, wine. I've been drinking a lot of wine this week. Yeah, you're liking that now, isn't it? Yeah, it's a different head on, isn't it? Well, yeah, it's so good. an acquired taste, isn't it, as they say? Yeah, but beautiful. I always thought it tastes like vinegar for about 15, 20 years. Um, and then all of a sudden, I started trying it in France, like I said, and that's it. I, I yeah. love a bottle of red now, or the odd white, but it's got to be the right white. got to be a bit yeah. sweet, not yeah. too dry. Mm. Oh, look at and, that yeah, question. Yeah. What wine do you drink, Shane? Well, um, basically, the last couple I've had Merlot, I've had a Rioja, um, oh, what was the other one? Malbec. Drinking the red wines recently. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. And with the right food as well. It's, oh my God, it's incredible. Yeah, with the right steak. Banging. Oof. Absolutely. Is that what you've been doing? Is it having a nice steak with some red wine? I'm getting pretty good at cooking the old steak. I know it's not really difficult, but there is there is a definite, you know, you the timings, you know, you get the timing right, you've got the perfect steak. You're, you're 30 seconds out, it's ruined. So there's a lot of discipline with steak. And it's quite difficult to keep time when you're drinking wine. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And the old um, the old hangover's absolutely terrible, like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> we are waiting for Johnny. He's just uh I think he's trying to get used to the to click in to get on, like you know. Okay. 
So, yeah, he should be with us any time. He's probably watching Bake Off and he's just going to make a cup of That's what it is. Well, I don't blame him. Yeah. <laughs> what are the comments doing, mate? That's what I'm looking at now. I'm going back a bit. Uh, what we got? What we got? What we got? I was, Iona, I was drinking whiskey tonight. Scottish whiskey. Yes, Scottish whiskey. What's the best Scottish whiskey? In your humble opinion, Iona. Let's see if I can, because I, I don't think I've, um, I don't think I've Ooh. dabbled too much with the old Scottish whiskey. There we are. Give, give the boys a plug in there. There we Thank go. Thank you for the cookbook, boys. Really appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. Ah, oh, lovely. Absolutely awesome. Shall we have a guest? Ah, oh, I'm, I'm so excited about this. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the super talented producer, actor, writer, radio presenter, Mr. Johnny Owen. <laughs> How's it going, boys? How's it going? <laughs> How are we, sir? I'm very good, thanks. That's quite a welcome. Lovely to be here, boys. How are you both? You all right? Yeah, not too bad, mate. Not too, I, I'm loving that accent. It's stronger than ours. <laughs> uh, uh, Murtha Tidville, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Myself and Shane were saying, Johnny, are you still in Wales or are you up country at all? You don't have to say where, obviously, but are you um have you left God's country at the moment or yeah, no, I, I live um I live up in Nottingham these days. Um and I spend a bit of time down in London as well, sort of work there a few days a week. So I, I haven't been back to Wales for about well, since before the first lockdown. So since uh, February, I don't think. But I think it's the longest time that I've ever not been to Merthyr. Which might be a good thing in some people's yeah. eyes. <laughs> I love going home. <laughs> um, I'm hoping maybe I can get back for Christmas because obviously they've announced today that they let in some um, people mix, aren't they? Some houses and stuff. So maybe fingers crossed, it'd be, it'd be good to get back and see the boys through me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We we love it as well because um, obviously back home there's been a bit of a ribbon when Murtha comes up with like the most COVID or you know that old score it is like whether you're pretend <laughs> or hey, Murtha, well done Murtha. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> then, I still do it now, boys. You know, like when you see on the BBC breakfast, my missus laughs at me and they give like the weather, sort of like you know, the temperatures in different parts of Britain. Yeah. Murtha will come up and I'll go, Murtha! Yeah. Murtha! She's all right. I'm like, I'm just Murtha on a map. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Never leaves you, is it? Never leaves no, you. But right enough. Absolutely right enough. Are you working at home at the moment or? No, I um I go I go into um I do a show for Talk Sport on the yeah. weekend uh, and I go down to London for that that's um that's broadcast from London Bridge so I have to go down to London on the weekend um and I do a bit of writing for a for a newspaper down there on a Sunday as well so I go down there usually on a Friday and come back up to Nottingham on a on a Monday um, but I can work from home sort of the other job that I do I've just uh, I finished a film and I do a bit of work for Nottingham Forest Football Club now look after their media and uh, comms. Wow. Uh, they're playing now, just now, they're 2-0 down, I just I was just watching it, <laughs> and I'm glad to join the show, because they're losing, but I, uh, so I do a bit of work for them in Nottingham as well, um, and I, they let me do that from home, so a bit of both really. What about yourselves, are you both sort of from home, or are you going into work? No, I mean, we're just the band now, so um, we're just continuing. There's nothing you could do, is it? It's a nightmare for bands, isn't it? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's a nightmare, obviously, playing to people, but... Um, you know, and it was difficult. We've said this in previous episodes. It's difficult to kind of get that creative buzz going when you know out there and experiencing the world, you know, and um, interacting and sort of speaking, connecting with people. But I think now we're in this place of we got all this time, and it's 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 a wonderful, it's a blessing almost, you know, as long as nobody gets ill. Um, but um, yeah. it's 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 a real time to sort of um, hone your skills, sort of speak, you know, your craft and that. And we've been really creative. Uh, um, with new new material in particular, um, I mean, this, this is how this spawned. You know, we had to do something like so. Yeah, yeah. Th thirty six weeks ago, we were just like, what can we do? What else can we do? How can we? Yeah. How can we have a gig? Do you know what I mean? Uh, what, yeah. You know, so how can we interact with the Crow family? How how can we actually speak to the fans? Know how they're feeling? So this is how this was born. It was just managed to get the technology together, and and we're doing it from the houses now. Like you know, so. And then it's mint, then we can obviously speak to you up in Nottingham, or we've had people on from LA, and it's mind blowing. Like, how we can just keep that that momentum going. That's the most important thing. You know, it's like exactly like a footy team, uh, you know, it's, you've got to keep that momentum going as a band. You, you've been in a band yourself, you know the score. 
moment the name starts to drop, uh, another band starts on the rise, and you know it's it's hard. Like, but we we got over Germany. We we've had a good year, I think. We managed to get over Germany a couple of months ago. Um, we managed to do a, a live stream up in Birmingham. So we've been very very fortunate of you know being a, a Welsh band on the rise and still managing to keep busy in 2020. Um, album came out, charted. Um, so yeah, it hasn't been a, a total washout for us at the moment. But I um I asked you if you're working at OMC because we've had few like ro uh, Planet Rock DJs on and stuff, and they tend to do their like what we're doing now. They've got all their computers and their software. So I was wondering, are you are you able to go into London to work at the moment, or are you just stuck stuck where you are? Like you know? No, I mean we had. Um, I just gonna just recap what you said. That's fantastic, boys. You still like saying making so much, you know doing such positive things with the time, you know what I mean? That's that's really important. And I'm sure the fans and everybody else would really appreciate the fact that you're doing stuff because communication and keeping in touch is so important because of mental health issues and all those other things as well, you know, you've got to think of. So I just think it's brilliant what you're doing. Um, but I just, uh, they were originally, uh, the first lockdown, a lot of the, um, the presenters were able to do it from home, but they've made the building COVID secure. Um, and they encourage us to go in. So there's obviously the screens up and things like that. I'm, I get a train down from Nottingham. There's nobody on the train. When I came back on Sunday, it was, I had a carriage to myself. Do you know what I mean? So I was like, so there's nobody on the, on public transport. Um, and then, like I said, I go to the offices and uh, and they're fine. Like I said, they're COVID secure. And they encourage us to go in as much as we can. I don't know if London went into, um, I think, is it called a tier one lockdown, which is the most severe one. And I think there's going to be more mm -hmm. stringent rules coming now. Maybe then we would have to look for work uh, to work from home, but at the moment uh, we're able to go in. I gotta say though, it's hard because there's no pubs open. And yeah. London, <laughs> oh, honestly, boys, London without pubs is mental. You can't do anything. There's nothing yeah. to do I, mean, I know I'm Welsh, like, and I love a pub, but I'm a bit like, God, you know what? When you're in a little flat and there's nothing open, it's it's it's, it's difficult. You know, all you're doing is going to work and coming from there. We're hoping. I'm hoping. Um, I think England comes out the lockdown. Um, I think it's next Saturday, Friday, and I uh, I hope that London is in tier two where some pubs are open, but I don't know. Do you know we'll see? Yeah. yeah, yeah, we've been we've been struggling with that. We we, we like a drink, obviously. Yeah, um, we've probably been drinking more in this lockdown <laughs> yeah. than we do on the road. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, but you know, it's just it's nothing better than it. I'm gonna pint around the table no. with the boys. With your mates, exactly. I miss it. I didn't I didn't realize how much I'd miss it. Yeah. Till this happened, how important it was to my life, really, the social side of it, just going out and seeing your mates and having a pint. Do you know what I mean? It's unbelievable, really, isn't it? Yeah, it really yeah, is. How you take that for granted? Because we've all yeah. been there, you know, and it's just always been there, haven't it? Like, you know, mm. from when your kids are, oh, yeah, we'll meet in the park or whatever you do. Yeah. Um, and then to, to get to an older stage where you enjoy that, that social to get out and, and have a few beers. And a lot of our friends are up country. So even that was bizarre at one point that we couldn't even go over the bridge to go and see him, like, you know? So, yeah, it's a real, it's a mind, you know, it's a real mind gone, like, you know? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's really funny because obviously I was, you, you Wales locked down before England and now we're in the middle of it. It's really interesting when you see your mates. And then I seen tonight some of the boys like in the pub, you know, talking to me and I was a bit like, oh, it's really strange them in a pub because it's been nearly a month now where, there's no pubs up here, so they're even doing it at different times as well, which is quite uh, quite yeah. interesting, really. Do you know what I mean? But it seems that they've um, they've got on the table and they've decided on Christmas on doing the same rules for Christmas. So I suppose it's nice that people can at least get to see one another for those few days around Christmas. Hundred percent, yeah. That's 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 everything to everyone, and you know the family and stuff, especially on Christmas. Yeah, absolutely, bud. Hey, listen. So, um, we got you on now, right? I'm, I can't wait to start talking about what you've done, mate. Um, I'm so like, so impressed with the films you've done. Um, can we can we start off with the, the Three Kings? Mm. Um, the, what what a what a wow. piece of film that was. Like, obviously, from when where the the football I grew up watching. I'm a Liverpool supporter, right? Yeah. And that gentleman over there, over there. <laughs> Is a Man United supporter, so it's perfect. perfect right? A perfect audience, yeah. <laughs> and, our, and our guitarist is a is um a scouser as well. He's a Liverpool supporter, so you know this band that all the time since we've been since we known each other in school. But the difference in those managers back then to now is unreal. The, well, life in general was completely different. But I didn't know, and perhaps it's ignorance, 
I didn't know that those three managers knew each other so well. Like they were, they were so close. They were, you know, played football together. Um, but like from obviously thirty miles apart from one, I I had no idea of this. That is unreal. More, the three of the most successful clubs that blew my mind. Absolutely blew my mind. It was educa- educational. Yeah, it was amazing. An amazing story, isn't it? I mean, yeah. and, and uh, specifically Manchester United and Liverpool are such probably the fiercest rivalry you'd certainly say in English football and one of the biggest in the world, really. Um, you know, the fact that it was born out of a time when these two managers were, like I said, great friends, you know, from the same part of the world, same background. And the fact that uh, Busby, who was the manager of Manchester United, recommended Shanky yeah. for the yeah. Liverpool job. It's yeah. extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, you yeah. think lesser men would have been more Machiavellian, really, wouldn't they? And not encourage somebody they know was going to be good to get a job like that. But yeah. no, you know, Matt Busby did the opposite because he was his great friend. He said, no, here's the man you should get in to Liverpool, my my friend uh, Bill Shankly. And then, like you said, to, to remain such close friends right through that rivalry the mid-60s when it really started, where they were winning cups and, and leagues and swapping them like two heavyweight boxers, really. It was astonishing. Yeah. But to be such close friends. And I, I, I spoke to Bill Shankly's granddaughter, Karen Gill, and she said to me, my grandfather was forever on the phone or going over to see Matt, you know, and Matt was on the phone here. And I was like, it's extraordinary to us to think now that in the modern world of sport and rivalry, could two managers be that close again who were such fierce rivals? It's an extraordinary thing. And then obviously Jock Steen was from the same part of the world and he used to regularly come down and visit them and, and stay with them and all those kind of things as well. So you're a bit like, I think it was, I think it was the shared background. They were obviously they were a bit like us. They were from the same part of the world. So you do feel a sort of like a common sort of bond because you know, you know, you know the similar, you know, the, some of the people, the community, all those things. They were all minors at 14, 15 years of age, extraordinary, all from the same background, all, you know, proud Scotsmen, loved football and were unbelievably talented. So it is a great story. And, you know, three of the biggest sporting institutions on the planet now, really, in Manchester United, Liverpool and Celtic were the result of these three blokes from working class Scotland. It's, it's an amazing story. It really is. Because if you look at the managers now, you look at, um, like I always think about Alex Ferguson, the mind games he played, but, you know, he was all, obviously Scottish. But like Mourinho, how he, the mind games, there was, there was none of that. It was almost like the best man wins. And that, that respect back then, that was like, as you said, it was, they lived so close to one another, the utter respect. And it was just one of the best team wins. And and yeah. all. Um, yeah. where there's, there's mind games with Mourinho or Alex Ferguson or <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's unbelievable. It, it you it completely educated me. Um, and how how long did you know about this story before you actually made it into a film, or did you come stumble across it and then? No, I I, I was a kid really, and uh, my father had worked in heavy industry underground and in the steelworks. Not unusual in South Wales, where you know we come from. Um, you know so. He was always pointing out that what I call other miners on telly. He would always go to me and my brothers. We work underground when Shankly would come on for argument's sake. And me and my brothers would do that classic thing of rolling, you know, all right, Dad, you told us. But bless him, he passed away in 2017, my old man. And um, not an ounce of self-pity, but he knew he was dying, bless him. And I was t- I t- said this to him. I was I used to lie on the bed with him and watch films because he was too weak. And I said, do you remember what he used to say about other miners? And he went, ah, oh, you remembered, oh, didn't you? And I went, yeah, I did. And then when he did eventually pass, I thought to myself, well, there's a story there. You know, there's a story about that generation of men and women who are leaving us now, who all worked in heavy industry, because those industries don't exist anymore. Um, so I had an idea about doing something about them three, because I knew that they were all miners. Um, I'd watched a brilliant series as a kid by, by a journalist called Hugh McElvenny about 30 years ago, which is called The Football Men, which is about them. So then when I went to the I went to this production company that made Senna and Amy, who were a brilliant production company, and I sort of said, look, I got this idea, and they'd seen some other stuff I'd done. So they were like, well, let's give it a go. Let's see. Let's do a modern sort of film about their story. And uh, one of the great pieces of, of advice I had all the way through it from uh, the producer, James, who won an Oscar for, for Amy, he kept saying to me, you need to make a film that an 18-year-old can watch that doesn't support any of the clubs. And that was his that was his tagline all the way through filmmaking. That's what he kept saying to me. You need to make a film that other people can watch and don't support the football clubs. So I was like, okay. So, you know, sometimes I had 70-year-old football, the Busby Babes played in the early 50s, you know. So I had to sort of cut it with modern music and cut it in a very modern way so that people now were used to watching Sky and the way we watch football now in a very specific way. 
can watch it, you know, and digest it and hopefully take from the story. So that's what we try to do really with this. We try to give it a real modern feel with modern music and uh, a modern way of putting it together. Oh, I mean, it was fantastic. Honestly, I, I'm even if you're not a, like you said, even if you're not a fan of football, the story and, and probably because we can you know, mine in sort of um, towns and stuff and 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 the when when men were real men, do you know what I mean? And like they mm-hmm. were, you know, like being a footballer now, that's their only job. They just got to be fit and, yeah. and stay fit. And but these boys were going to 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 war and 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 and. I'm like different, different kettle of fish completely. Like, and I go and play football and be the best in the country. It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, they were different. They were, they were a different breed almost. When I remember, I show my age and my voice, but when I was a boy in the mid seventies, my old man, the, 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 my old man worked uh, at Lewis Pit. Uh, but there was a there was a guy walking up the street. I can remember vividly now, um, and he must have worked at Merthyr Vale. This is Merthyr Town Centre. My dad went, "Oh, see that fella there? He's the face captain." Which is a great term, isn't it? So he's the guy in charge of the face workers, which is like the sort of like you know the thing in mind you can do. Like I remember, like being a kid, like it's like a superstar walking past, you know, like like a modern day rock star. <laughs> you know, he's the face captain, you know, and those great sort of like uh, positions they had, where you know, and that's why I used Burton at the start of the film, who talked about the way the miners walked and the way that you know him as a boy used to look at the miners in uh, Pondry de Ven, where he was from, and wanted to be like one of them, you know. They 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 sort of behaved in a certain way because they were very aware that they did the very difficult work in in industry. You know what I mean? And that gives you a certain you know certain way of walking, I suppose. You know what I mean? And uh, I love all those stories where you hear that about you know the way those men behaved and the way they were. I mean, they were brilliantly organised because they were all in unions. My old man was the same, so they could all argue a point. You could I couldn't argue with my old man. You know what I mean? Because he could argue back with you. Because that's what they did. <laughs> So, you know, it's like all those things that you realise are great characteristics that you need to management. You know what I mean? Organised, have to inspire people, got to be tough, got to be able to argue a point. But suddenly you go, well, it makes sense, actually, that this, this uh, generation of men and where they come from were able to make great managers. And it's funny you should mess, uh, touch on Alex Ferguson because he's kind of the last of them, really, isn't he? He's the last yeah. of the great Scottish managers who himself worked in the Glasgow shipyards and was a union man and all that kind of stuff. And he transferred that to the to the football pitch so and like you said it fascinates i think now with a bit of time passing it's even more fascinating because we live in a world now of brilliant modern um foreign coaches you know like Mourinho's and guardiola's great you know and changed the game and i love them do you know what i mean but then when you look back at somebody like a, a bill shankley saying that he put somebody in jail if yeah. they didn't give 100 percent you yeah. just go well i'll have him but it, isn't, isn't that the, i want somebody to care yeah. and try their best you know what I mean? but isn't that the like the, the difference where i think you're, you're absolutely right talking about alex ferguson and, and we do have a chat you know about liverpool and man united and i can't believe i'm admitting this but he what ferguson did with with average players those those young players growing up they were average players right he made them into to machines and I, I, it's the mentality like and, and listening to shankley and what he demanded i think um busby was a probably more like a father figure but shankley yeah. was like this this powerhouse this you, you give what everybody else gives or you're gone um what lessons like in it that's i don't think because it can't kind of, i mean it's like the film uh, you know the more i studied the film I'm, you know i i am a, I'm an admirer of all three clubs i think they're fantastic football clubs and they've contributed so much to football but you know like you were saying like Liverpool's a cult isn't it you know every other football fan of every other team will say Liverpool's a bit of a cult you know Liverpool fans are, they don't lose a match ever today it's never their fault it was all those kind of stuff you say <laughs> with Liverpool fans and you know the, the manager is like the messiah Klopp now is the messiah fa- fa- you know fantastic that comes from Shankly Shankly yeah. is a bit like you know it's my house Anfield if you if you go there and it's even when Liverpool were you know not the top team in the country in the nineties. Still a difficult place to go and feel always. And even now, you know, they they sit on top of you as a team. I mean, you know, they play. Like my mate was saying they they play sort of two two six at Anfield. You know, there's like you know, there's yeah. like they just they just attack you all, all the game. Yeah. And that comes from Shankly. The personality of Shankly is still in Liverpool's fans and the way Liverpool play. And that's brilliant. I love the fact they did that. And then you got Man United, and somebody said brilliantly, Manchester United's fans they clapped off Fat Ronaldo when he scored the hat trick against Real Madrid. You know, they yeah. clapped him off the pitch. Liverpool fans would never do that. And that's Liverpool fans. It's brilliant. Liverpool is an implacable kind of support. You know, when I mean, you go to Anfield, it's their house. Whereas Man United fans, because of Busby, they can almost enjoy other great footballers coming there. And that's 
almost something I thought myself, that's fascinating that is that this rooted in their characters, but also they both still got those uh, characteristics of the men that are slightly re re rebels, slightly outside England. Like Manchester United fans, I got Manc mates, they don't support England. This is what Man United did. Liverpool fans, Scouse, not England. Only Liverpool fans would walk out of a game over ticket prices. Do you remember that when they walked out of a game? <laughs> yeah, they walked out. Well, Aston Villa fans wouldn't do that, or Newcastle fans, or Arsenal fans. Manchester United fans, even to this day, you know, they split up some United fans and formed their own club because they felt yeah. the club was becoming too, you know, commercialised. FC United, you know, yeah. the green, the green and gold scarves. You know, Celtic, very similar. You know, the banners, uh, Im immigrants and refugees are welcome here. You know, they they are they're, they're sl all comes from three men. The three men were never men of the establishment. And the clubs yeah. and the fans are still the same now. Those three clubs are very specific personalities. That fascinates me. Fascinates me. Yeah. It fascinated me and and it, and it even captivated my boy who was 16. Massive football fan. But it was the generation thing. So me and Shane are, are in our 30s. Um, but it, it captivated like... He even turned around and said that Busby, which he didn't realise, and I said this to Shane off air, was so there's so much of Ferguson there. It's, yeah. it's almost like you 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 say it. In, I don't want to spoil it too much, but you say it in there about his his shadow being cast over Old Trafford. Yeah. That's a beautiful how you how that was in there. Yeah, because that's what's happening now with Ferguson. I mean, it's yeah. exactly you know in twenty years time if you did something very similar, you'll see Ferguson still sitting in the stand now. Yeah. Um, and he's looking down at the managers who are not succeeding and and nobody can shake that success, that that hold he had on the club from the ground up. Yeah, um, it's amazing, isn't it? Our, our history yeah. has repeated itself with that. And, 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 you know, the way my mates who are Mancunians as well, you know, from, from Moston, which is a, you know, big Man United area. When Mourinho, they've been going there since the 70s, when Mourinho was there and other fans used to sing, park the bus, park the bus, Man United, because he was playing so defensive, they hated it. It yeah. literally, it 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 was it it made them squirm because in their DNA they were Man United fans. Manchester United are meant to attack. Manchester United are meant to have wingers. They meant to be like about Georgie Best and Eric Cantona and David Beckham and Ryan Gay. That's why Manchester United. You think yeah. of Man United. So to have a team that would go somewhere and set up defensively is an to Man United fans, and they hated that. And it's amazing the way that when Klopp went to Liverpool, there wasn't a single football fan who didn't go. That's a good fit. That's a good fit. Do you know, you just knew, didn't you, in your heart, you went, Klopp would get it going there if, he, if they give him enough time, and they did, and he's got it going. It's amazing how a club's personality is dictated by these men, and they now, you now need to get almost the same guy in, or somebody similar, which is what Ferguson had with Man United, that he was so similar to Busby in the sense of what he tried to get going, a youth system, attacking football, and all those kind of things, which were all rooted in, in Busby. And then Klopp goes to Liverpool, does the same thing. You know, he needs to have a relationship with the cop for a start. That's the most important thing you can do in Liverpool, because Shankly had it. When Shankly said, I'm one of them and they are one of me, well, if you get a few decent results when you say that as a manager, you'll have him, won't you? You'll go, well, I'll have this fella, because yeah. he's the same as me and I'm the same as him. Shankly did that brilliantly. And the great journalist Paddy Barker gave me a fantastic line about Liverpool. He went, what makes Liverpool unique is what and what Shankly created there was when you create the relationship between the fan and the manager, the players have nowhere to hide. What a line. And he said, Liverpool players have nowhere to hide now because they will get the blame if they don't play well. Not the manager. But yeah. They were, and so you can't, you know. He says the players used to play injured for Shankly because they knew the fans would go. Well, if he's picked you, you got to play, and that's yeah. the relationship that Klopp has got now with Liverpool. His relationship with the fans is so concrete that he's got a great opportunity to to to, to really build on European cups and titles already, and that goes back to the way Shankly was. It's, and when the film pulls up, you know, when I was doing the film, I was finding out more and more of these things as you were saying, and that fascinated me that you can go trace everything back and exactly like you said you can trace back what's happening now with Ferguson to exactly what happened to Busby where when it's, somebody that magnitude leaves a club it's so difficult how do you get them to fill their shoes it blew my mind of how you've 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 brought your movie out of a time where it's almost repeating itself in a yeah. different in a different era so you have got Klopp there now and he has got the Liverpool fans there and I, I hate it because he's such a he is a great manager and yeah, it's just yeah. You know, his heavy metal of football and and he and he's there and he's passionate and he don't care and he swears on interviews and he don't care about, you know, when people say, oh, you can't speak about the refs like that, Klopp will, he'll take a fine. Yeah. Um, and then you've got Man United now, like we are struggling. We have 
had one of the best managers in the world and how do we how do we recover and how do you recover when everybody got to look up into those dugouts and he's still sitting there like do you know what I mean do you know what somebody said to me a great thing actually uh, off air I think it was when I was talking to Radio Manchester they went to me a brilliant he was a United fan he went to me do you know what's happened there's a kink in the universe and Man City because of the oil money they've got Man United's manager and I was like yes he's a Guardiola <laughs> Should be managing Manchester United this last two years. I'm yeah. going at the club, but I was like, that's a great point, actually. Yeah, he said, that's, they've got a manager. He should have been at Manchester United this last few years, playing the football the way he does, battling Klopp every step of the way. But because of money, he went to Man City, and I was like, I've never thought of that before. Do you know what I mean? I, I didn't know if that was was it money or timing. Was it? It was bit of everything, to, yeah, a bit of everything, really, isn't it? Because you know I mean? Guardiola took that year off, didn't he? Yeah, and, yeah. and I could have kicked Man United because it's almost like just wait, just let him have an holiday, let yeah. him have a year off, and then have Guardiola. So you're yeah. you're completely bang on. And yeah. then when they when they had Klopp, when me and him were rehearsing, I was just like, yeah, he's all right, didn't he? He's he's all right, like you know. And uh, <laughs> and then the more he's done for him, I mean, the football he's got him playing, it is a shame that 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 isn't there, that banter, that that like you said, pushing each other more than anything. I know. Yeah, it is. I don't know what Manchester United are going to do, really. Um, I don't know if, if Oli is the answer. We'll see, do you know what I mean? But you do, you, like you said, you do worry a little bit because it's been, it's been, oh, at some point, six, seven years now. It's a long time for, you know, to, to, where that, soon, that soon, soon turns into a decade. And then once it turns into a decade, as Liverpool discovered with the title and then United before that in the 80s, it becomes a, it becomes a weight on your neck then. It's like, oh, you know, we're still a long way off winning the title. And both clubs, uh, as we can know, because of you know, 19 and 20, 20 titles each, you know, it, it, between the two of them, they're obsessed with winning the title. It's, it's what they do. They, I mean, they've, they've won nearly 40 between the two of them, which is an extraordinary figure, really. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you could see the same with your movie with when Shankly had stepped down, the struggles then of finding the right guy to replace, because like the Liverpool fans won't accept. A, a lesser man, like, do you know what I mean? So it has but to be... Yeah. Above Paisley, when he, Paisley kept it oh. going. Paisley was a clever man because he didn't try to change anything. He required the man. He kept it going. But, you know, me and Pete Hooten from the farm were saying it was a very slow, slow, slow progress to, to, with Liverpool. But it was a, but it was that. See, after the, after Paisley, kind of, whereas he said, you know, with Klopp, we kind of realised we've got the man. And he said to me, it's interesting, actually. They've, they're almost kind of glad now, in a way, that Brendan Rodgers didn't win the title because they wouldn't have got Klopp in, which is a really interesting way of looking at it. Mm. I love it. Can I um can I just play this trailer for everybody who's watching at the Most moment? Time. Who's going? I would I would love to know what they're on about. So let me just play this quick trailer. Hang on, here we go. You're the most famous man in soccer in this country, and indeed, I suppose, in the world, the most famous man. And yet you've always gone quietly about your business. You shun publicity in a way, don't you? And here comes the man that they would have for Prime Minister President and everything. Matt Busby. This is the man they love. Bill Shankly. I think that if a man needs a, who's, who's playing in front of the public is being well paid and he doesn't dedicate himself to the job, I wouldn't, I would, I'd be hard on him. I'd, I would, if I could, I'd put him in jail. Out the road, uh, society, because it's a menace. You play a football match without fans, you've got nothing. It can be the greatest game in the world. If there are no people there to watch it, it becomes nothing. Uh, Outstanding. I was, when when Shankly's talking, I'm like, ah, yes. <laughs> yeah, he's <laughs> right. <laughs> I love Go on, Bill. I love it. Oh my god! On honestly, you've got to be so proud of that. It's it's incredible. We were we were non-stop chatting about it before you came on. Um, before we even did like the the, the going live or anything, um, because we were just so worked up about it. Like you know, as, as footy fans as well, it's nice to watch something uh, that you do get invested in, and you don't have to be a fan of 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 all three clubs, like you said, because there's just so much drama. Um, yeah. that's what you've created here, John. You've created like a lot of drama because even the end, which I don't want to, I, you know, I don't know if a lot of people know the history, but the end got me with, with Stein. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't know that. I thought you put a little cheeky thing in with Wales scoring and stuff. Ah, here we go. He's going to, he's going to put the Welsh over you, but yeah, yeah, I yeah. didn't know, I didn't know that was coming. Um, no, I, I was there that night as well. I was, I was, I was a kid. I was with my father and my grandfather and, uh, yeah, I really, wow. um, I really remembered it so well, you know, and the silence after the game, because obviously he had 
links with Wales because he played in Llanelli, believe it or not. Um, and obviously because he was a minor, and he was a minor until he was in his sort of mid to late twenties. Jock, so you know he, he had a great affinity with with the Welsh people, and there's a lovely uh, photograph. I couldn't put it in the film, but I don't have time. But before the game, they're warming up Wales in front of the Scottish fans. They brought about 50, 10, 15,000 down, uh, and the ball went into the fans. They wouldn't give it back, um, and Southall was asking for the ball back, you know, uh, and they wouldn't give it to him. And Steen comes out of the dugout and sort of says to these like ten thousand Scots, "Give us the ball back," and they throw it back. That's the respect they had for him. <laughs> <laughs> and gives the ball to Steen, and it's a beautiful photograph of Steen, like um, Southall going, Thank you very much to Jock, you know. And that's the kind of, I suppose, that's the kind of uh, respect people had for him, you know. They were giants, really, do you know what I mean? And uh, and, and the point of the film, you know, I'm, I'm really glad you love it, boys. And, and the thing is, is that I'm not trying to say in the film things were better then, I'm just trying to say they were different, that's all. And so, therefore, have a look at this and see how different football was and how different these men were and how, you know, different yeah. pitches were and everything else, really. Do you know I mean? And then you can go, oh, right, that's really interesting. And that's what I hope kids can can take from it, is that, you know, football, in some ways, you think... It's like that great saying, every every generation thinks it invented sex, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? You know, yes, yes. Thing. And it's the same with football, I think. We're a bit like that. Every generation thinks, you know, big crowds and parades are all a new thing. And that was the point of all the stuff in the mid-60s, you know, when, when United and, and Liverpool were bringing on the FA Cup to Liverpool and Manchester. And there's hundreds of thousands of people in the streets, you know, swaying. And it's a bit like, it was the same then, really. And then I go back in the early part of the film to the early part of the 20th century, 140,000 crowds at Hampden Park and things like that. You know, you think, you think now, you think 40,000 is a big crowd now. Yeah. Then 140,000. I mean, you know, how do you even get them in the stadium? So the idea is, is that, you know, Football is forever changing, but ultimately and essentially it stays the same. And I think that's what makes it the most popular team sport on the planet. It's still about getting a bag of air between two sticks, really. Either end of it. Yeah. You, know. you touched on it earlier about um like Anfield and going to play in Anfield. There was clips out of that movie, which I loved, and it's almost daunting of how you've got you can see the crowd and how they how intimidating. Yeah, that was like that got me. I was like, yeah. wow, that's you know, but yet again, that's the that's the footy fan in me. I was like, wow, that's you capped that that was the perfect frame to put in there over the the, the narration because it was just more like, wow, that's you you forget of how close and how compact they were and how of one they were like, you know. And then the opposite end of the theatre of dreams where everybody and I hate to see it as a man fan, but everybody's sitting there clapping, applauding the good football, and then you go to yeah. Anfield and everybody's there like you know, ready, ready for battle. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is really interesting, isn't it? It's a oh. difference to the two. I was, I, I remember I did, um, I'm good mates with Shane Meadows, the filmmaker, and he did a documentary about the Stone Roses about what, seven, eight years ago now called Made of Stone. And I was lucky enough to go into his edit suite, he'd call me in because I was a big Roses fan. Uh, and believe it or not, they did a gig at Spike Island in about 1989, 1990 that I went to. Uh, and it, was, it wasn't filmed. Sounds ridiculous now, whenever this filmed. Um, but somebody managed to sneak in a little cine camera. And all they've got are these shots of the crowd. And um, this is, a, obviously, because it's the late 80s, the crowd moves in a very specific way. And I remember turning to him and he said to me, that's because of the terraces. And I went, yeah, people knew how to move and sway in crowds because they were off the terraces. So you had to sort of, You'd have it in Cardiff, at the, you know, on the Bob Bank. If it was a busy, if it was a big, big game, and you know, you'd have to move a certain way. And you know, if you were, if you had a chance, or if, if you scored, you could you could wound up twenty yards from your mates, you know, in a different part of the stand yeah. because of the way everybody moved. And those really big stands, like the Cop and the Kipaks in Man City and the North Bank in in Highbury and the Shelf in Spurs, they were places where, I mean, looking back, you know, with modern health and safety dangerous but sexy when it's dangerous you know it's like rock and roll there even when you're 18 and you're in those ends where you're in there's nothing like it the atmosphere is sort of like you know it's heightened feral but something yeah. sexy about it as well and it is yeah. as young human beings we just can't help but be attracted to that something the great gigs you know you boys know when you get a mosh pit really going in a big gig it's probably nothing there's nothing like it when you're all into the music moving with it at the same time and it's getting you know, to the point where people are lost in it, I suppose. You know yeah. what I mean? Like the match. There's nothing like it, is there? But that's that's the beautiful story you've told. You got you 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 start off with like the minors and 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 football is this way of like this escaping that escapism, and then they come together as one. And as and as you said, they are one. They are. It's it is um dangerous. It is. That's what they live for. You know yeah. what I mean? It's, it's, yeah. 
it's unbelievable the story you told, but um, I, 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 I would, anybody watching this, please go and watch this film. Whether you're a fan of football or not, it did something to me. Um, and I'm, I'm quite sort of, I thought I knew a bit about football, but clearly I don't. And where no. it came from and stuff. Um, it, it, it did, honestly. It was like me and, me and the boy were buzzing. And then when I started speaking to you, then I was like, there was just so much I didn't know. Um, and dramatic, like I said, I yeah. am, you know, there's very, very I, few footy stuff that you watch and it captures the dramatic of it. The because it is, it's entertainment at the end of the day, like you know, it is. Yeah. Uh, when you, the, I mean, the babes, I mean, the story of the babes is, oh. is heartbreaking because yeah. they just they, they came at just the time of when the teenager was was arriving, you know, the disposable income, rock and roll, and the way they looked and their hair and their beer. And so, the yeah. country, especially Britain, really got behind. These kids really playing beautiful football and then they die in a, in a plane crash. Oh, you yeah. know, you're just heartbreaking. Do you know what I mean? And you just, you don't realise it because we're all, you know, we're all aware of the Munich Air disaster, but it's something in the past. But when I was able to sort of like really look into it, how much the country loved these young boys and the way they played and the spirit in which they played. And, the, and then the footage, they were all smiling and they'd score a goal and one of them would kick it off and they'd all be, and they were mates. And you just think, wow, you know, Duncan Edwards, you know, was arguably going to be the greatest English player ever. Bobby Charlton was on the plane and all, all those things. And you go, I understand, you understand there, you know. And then Busby survives it and is, mm. is in a, you know, as an horrendous sort of, you know, uh, physical sort of uh, smash in the plane, comes back and builds another team that has Georgie Best in it and, and wins the European Cup 10 years later. I mean, if you wrote that in a script, people would go, Oh, you're pushing it a bit, pal. Yeah, you know, they win the European Cup, You know what I mean? Yeah. But he did that extraordinary man, really, to sort of to come back and the moral courage he must have had to build that back up again. And then, then you start seeing instead of like people sometimes dismissing the Manchester United and the Liverpools and these clubs and going, "Oh, Man United." Well, there's a reason why Man United are, are supported the way they are and loved the way they are. And this goes back to these things that happen and these stories and the way this man came back and then the way he tried to play football and the way he won a European Cup again. You know, that's the reason why they're one of the biggest football clubs, if not the biggest football club in the world. Same with Liverpool. There's a reason why people support Liverpool all over the world, because, you know, the Cop and Shankly and the way they played in the European Cup just means that people are attracted to that. That's just the way it is. You know, and that's what the film I tried to do in the film, really, is try to say, well, there's a reason why these football clubs are what they are. It's because of these men and the, and the personalities they left in the clubs. Yeah. I uh, mean, this, this story you told was absolutely beautiful, and I'm, I'm so, I'm so glad we watched it. But if we can move now, if that, if that film hit me hard, <laughs> the next, the next one, don't take me home. Oh my <laughs> god! Ah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I tried. To, I had, I had a laptop, right? Now I watched parts of it, but I hadn't, I hadn't, I hadn't sat down and watched it all, right? I did yesterday. I sat down with my laptop because I, I know I, it was almost like I knew it all. I knew the story. So I was like, I was there, lived it. Ronnie was out there, uh, lived it more than I did. But I, I knew the story. But I thought, oh, you know, Johnny's coming on. I got to watch it. So I sit down to watch it with my laptop thinking I got loads of work to do. And I thought I'll have it on in the background. Mate, I didn't do any work. <laughs> <laughs> I was just watching the film, tears. I was, I was pumped, and even, even the game with Portugal, right? I know how it, how it turns out, but I'm there going, oh, maybe, uh, hope it will change somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could have changed that bit in the end, couldn't change. Yeah, it took me straight back to how we ne- we sh- we should have beaten Portugal. Mm. We, sh- we should we sh- if we'd had Ramsey, you know, but Ben Davis, Ben yeah, Davis, ben well. Davis. Yeah. Mm. yeah, what yeah. if? To annihilate Belgium like we did in the manner we did, unbelievable. Wow. Wow. I, I think, I think, I think that um, that was a labour of love. That film was, you know, to do that. Um, when when I got back, I went. I was in France for really five weeks, and then I got back, and um, my missus uh, and we went away to Lanzarote with her family. And I get a phone call out there, um, and it was a Welsh FA and, and a production company and uh, Best Productions. And they went, "Would you be interested in doing the Wales film?" And I was like, oh, "I'll swim back." From Lanzo, yeah. like, <laughs> would I be interested? Yes, do you mean yeah. dive in the sea there? But I was like, and I and I did it, and they did say to me, it's a really quick turnaround, which in film terms is really quick. It's got to be out for St David's Day in the March. So I was like, okay. So and they said, but what we can do is we can get the players together for you to be to interview at the next international break. And I did them all in a day. It took me about twelve hours altogether, and I did Cookie Cookie Chris Coleman separately down in Winchester. 
but I got great stuff off them. And then I just went and made the film then. But what I love about the, uh, the whole thing was, is that uh, even though we didn't win the tournament, we are still the smallest country to ever get to a semi-final, which is in itself extraordinary. But it was also that last line, which made me fill up when he first said it to me, was where Chris Coleman just almost all looks off into space and goes, I just never thought we'd have the old country behind us. And I wanted to give him a cut, you know, and to go, Chris, Jimmy, we loved you. But he didn't expect it, you know. And I, thought, I think what was lovely about us in France and, and the film, we we'll try to capture that, is none of us expected it. It was just a beautiful thing that happened. And this perfect storm, after all the misery that Wales fans have gone through football-wise of nearly qualifying, when we finally get there, it was like as if whatever the higher power is, God, the head of the universe, Buddha, whatever you want to call him, went, oh, go on, you lot, you can have a summary of your lives. You deserve <laughs> this. <laughs> it was just great. Do you know what I mean? It was like as if they went, go on, Wales, you crack on. It was just a great, great summer. That, that feels, for me personally, like that's my movie. Um, and I can tell you there are thousands of, of Welsh fans um, and probably few English as well. Uh, it, it's our it's our movie. It's our personal. Because um, I, I said to Shane, I mean, I remember I was starting. My mate rang me, he said, uh, we're doing the Euros when we qualify because we did all the games. Yeah, we're, it don't matter. And he said, we're going to do a tournament ticket. And he told me the price. I went, well, we'd probably be lucky to, you know, last, you know, last 16, first game, get back yeah. home, happy days. And obviously, as we kept going, and I've said this on other things, the money kept going there. And of, of course, we were still stuck out in France. So I'm having to explain to the missus and the yeah. band at the time when it was like, uh, that two weeks is turning into... Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> nobody expected it, didn't they? We were all a bit like, I don't know this is going to happen. It was <laughs> mine. We were, we were rearranging the... Because we didn't go out in a camper or anything. We booked a couple of weeks out in a car. We'd hired a car out there. We were going around following them. Um, Every game you're going through the motions, that England game, Jesus Christ, we went to a, a small campsite, which was like a lower low. Um, <laughs> no fans around. It was the most miserable couple of days. And we were in mourning. We were like, ah, oh, I can't believe it. And then obviously, you know, to pick yourself back up. And now we played in Russia. I always say that night in Toulouse was just like... Oh, magical. I, I got a photo about the way I'm like right up at the back of the stand. The sun is coming down on the stadium. And I was bawling. I was, yeah. I, I'm not ashamed to say it because as a Welsh fan who used to watch him playing on the race course it, with like yeah, yeah. supporters, no one else would fucking go and watch him. Um, to go and watch him then out in Toulouse in a in a tournament, you know, where I'm like, where are you, where are you? And then to watch him play that type of football, I was just like, oh, this is incredible. So then, like you said, we get through the group and then the Northern Ireland, you know, your ass is doing that. We get through. Yeah. And that Belgium game, I went over with Ryan and um, we, were, we were all travelling over, me, Ryan and John, and it was a case of like, ah, well, it's been a great tournament. <laughs> we're literally talking it down as we're getting over yeah. there. Ah, it's been a great go, you know, and we were putting up all the socials, our journey and how it's been. And then literally never thought we would play like that against Belgium. And then oh, all yeah. of a sudden, the mind is that on the way home, we're all going, we can fucking win this. I know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're all going but you know what? If we can, if we, do you know the best bit was against Belgium as well? My sister and my mate, as we get in the stadium, went, as long as we don't concede early. Because they had like Edwin Hazard, De Bruyne, yeah. Carl, best. Or, to me, know, my favourite. Best, best team, I reckon. Yeah. Yeah. My sister was all, you know, we had like you say, blessing, you know, Al Robson Carno and Chris Kennedy were playing for Red Inn at the time. And I was a bit mm -hmm. like, listen, as long as we don't score early, you know, we'd be all right. But it could get ugly if they score early. And they score early with that belter. And then after that, it was totally fantastic, you know. And I, I was thinking, it's funny what you were saying earlier on. I remember saying to my mate, I went, oh, as long as we're there now, it's all right. I'm going to go there. As long as we can sing the anthem, that'll do yeah. me. Yeah. And, then, you know, and then it was like incremental things. I went, I'd have to score a goal. And we scored. Yeah. And then after half of the first game, was going, I'd have to win this now. You know, and then it was like, it kept building, really. Yeah. And that night, when Mrs. tells a story, and I, I don't mind people, it's a good laugh. I went after the game against um, Slovakia, and when it got to 1 1, my missus watched that game. She came over that one, then she flew back, bless her. And when it was to 1 1, I said to her, I gotta go now. To my eternal shame, I went, I'm gonna go out. This is too much for me. I can't, yeah. I, I just, as long as we get the point, I'm all right. And she, yeah. bless her, turned to me and she went, I think you win 2 1. And you know that, all right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, we win 2 1, right? So we, after the game, we go for a meal with Gary Bertles, who used to play for England, and he was the commentator and the other co-commentator to this lovely little restaurant. It was, it was full of Wales fans. And, 
and we were eating dinner and I was drinking red wine and apparently I, was, I got a bit pissed and my missus said I kept going I'm so happy <laughs> <laughs> Effeminate Welsh thing. I'm so happy. I am so happy. And that was all I kept saying about it. But I was very, very happy because we got into this tournament and we'd won this game. And then, like you said, it was a mad, it was a magic carpet right after that. It, it was it was the best without wanting to, to exaggerate. I can say this with all sincerity. It was the best summer of my life. Because it was just yeah. I was out there with my mates were out there. I did it in all the ways you could possibly imagine. I met the Murtha boys. I did a little bit of corporate. I went with the missus. So I did a, I did a mix and match. But I, I loved it. And I loved the fact that the Wales fans were so well thought of and had a party whenever they went. I loved that. Well, we, thought, we were the tournament. That yeah, was the thing. I, Everybody wanted a party with the Welsh. It was... Yeah. It was our it was our tournament. That's yeah. no offense to the Portuguese. You know, they, they had the trophy, but yeah. we had the story. And I think yeah. that that's why I, I I'm exactly the same as you, but there's like I can't wait to, if we we get to have a beer with you and everything. I could literally yeah. just this one this one topic I could spend years talking about. It's like because <laughs> yeah. for everything, there's a story. There's um there's you know, we did. We were one of the ones who did the the ten hour drives and stuff back and forth the country. You know, or yeah. oh shit, okay, we're through. What are we gonna do? Uh, oh, well, <laughs> where's well, Leon? Where's yeah. Leon? South, all right. Yeah. Oh fuck, right. Um, and then we went out on one of those planes, one of those trips we did, and you know, a lot of the Murtha boys went out on there, so we knew the Murtha boys, yeah. um, like your Dave Driscolls and people oh, like that. Like, Driscoll, yeah, boy. exactly. So we were like, oh fucking hell, die and all of that. And yeah. next thing you know, it's like Schmeichel's in the airport. We're all like, way fucking Schmeichel and all that. <laughs> There's just so many. So many like memories. I've never yeah. had so many stories to tell from one one event, one trip. Like it is like being oh, in a band. That 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 you know, tournament. That's, that's exactly what it's like to be like. I got one quick story that I think summed it up for, and I say this to Welsh lads, they fucking cry laughing. We drove from Lille to Leon, me and my mate Dougie, right? And he had, he took time off work. So he had to ring in from work, and then by some weird thing, we get to the hotel and it was a Radio 1 DJ there, right? Or journalist there. And he goes, are you Wales fans? Because we, because we'd driven through the night. We must have been the first ones down there. And the guy on reception waited for us to come. He waited through the night and he went, I wanted to meet you because you're Wales fans. And this is a French guy. So this is when I had the first indication something really special was happening. That people were waiting to see and meet Wales fans. So this DJ says, our journalist says to us, will you do a quick chat to us? So I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I said, well, look, He's, he's meant to be in work and his boss is a bit twitchy about it, but he's come down with me. Could you do an appeal on air? So they were like, yeah. So we did this live appeal on air and Dougie, my mate's boss, live on air, they managed to get hold of him. They did a, a little thing about it. Said, yes, have a few days off. And we all did a big, bit of a cheer and it was brilliant. So that was a lovely moment. But what had happened was when we were driving down, right? We were driving from Lille right to Lyon and they had those Pull in places in France. They're beautifully done, and they like a nice toilet. The place. Yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. Be not like our service stations, like a class above that. Again. With the bakeries. <laughs> yes. <all that. laughs> Fucking so bakeries, they like. We're driving along, and there's a bloke standing, and I think it's a wheel stop. Quite a cadaverous man, really thin, just sort of standing there. And I pull up, and so it's a 1980s Wrexham top, right? Wrexham lager. Wow. He's in his he's in his seventies. And he, and he sort of walks over to us and we do the classic. All right, bud, all right. And over he comes, you know. And he goes, all right, lads. And he goes, uh, how's it going? We go, yeah, brilliant. How are you, mate? And he goes, good, I'm all right. Yeah, he says, uh, uh, what's happening? I said, oh, how do you mean? He said, well, he said, well I know we've won. I'm heading down. But he said, I've got no Wi-Fi. I've got that old thing. And he points to a really, like, broken down old sort of Volkswagen camper van. He said, when he got that, he said, how is it? And we were like, oh, it's great back home. It's fun parks, new countries, talking about Wales, Europe is, you know, we're leading on talk sports stories, BBC. He said, it's fantastic. He went, oh, it's great. He said, I don't really know what's going on. He said, he said because to be honest, with you, as he says it, this little Scottish woman arrived out of nowhere, obviously his missus, and she goes, this wanker, this <laughs> fucking wanker, told me I'd be home in two weeks for your fucking rubbish. And I'm still here. And she walks off. <laughs> Ah, oh, that's class. <laughs> and that, that <laughs> sums it up. <laughs> and as she's walking away, my mate goes, we're all the same. We didn't think we did. She goes, oh, fuck off. And <laughs> <you're gone. laughs> so this poor bastard from Wrexham had obviously gone. We'll be able to get two weeks level the most. It's broken up. 
five <laughs> weeks later, he's still driving around France and his kids is going, one more game, one more game. Do you know what I mean? Bless him. But she was really annoyed with him. But that sums it up. Nobody yeah. would have expected us to be out there for that long. And she was fucking furious with him, she was. Well, it was the Dean Pumped Saunders. It. Do you see the Dean Saunders yeah. one? Yeah. <laughs> Rod it's... Gilbert, wasn't it? Rod Gilbert with the bins. Can somebody put yeah. my bins out? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. All that <laughs> Amazing. Oh, go for me, my car park in fine. Yeah. <laughs> I can't what do you think of the airport when it was like a thousand pounds or something, wasn't it? Because it was like <laughs> the most expensive thing. So it was going up and up and up. There's so many great stories of all that. People like bunking off work and, you know, just hiring vans. And oh, my brother came out there, my younger brother. He was a lady. My younger brother said to me, proper mirth about my brother. He went to me, I went, I've snagged you a ticket for um, Northern Ireland, Paris. All right, son. Brilliant. So I said to him, um, well, how are you going to get out there? All oh, the Merthyr boys have got a van going overnight and we'll get, all right, great. So I said to him, I didn't text him. He's terrible for text. Then I went, where can I meet you? And I swear to God, this is true. On the morning of the game, he said, I'm meeting by the Eiffel Tower. That's what he said. <laughs> I was like, it's fucking huge. It's got a big story. Anyway, I get the Eiffel Tower. You know, and he said, Mid midday by the Eiffel Tower. So I get to the Eiffel Tower. There's thousands of people there, fan parks, no signal. And I'm thinking, well, that's the end of that. And I turn around. And there's 10 Merthyr boys walking on the street, in with a fag on the front, as if it's the most natural thing in the world. They'd be there. All right, Sam. All right, all right, Pat. You can take it out. Uh, you take it out, thinking, how the fuck in hell is that working? It's full of stories like that, you know, of like just great things happening. It all, it all coming together beautifully, you know, people getting tickets and all, you know, everybody getting in and people managing to find ways of getting there. I was just, it was just perfect, wasn't it? In, in everything, really, except if it won it, you know, we could have all probably just... Uh... I don't think we needed to. I don't think we needed to. I think like like I, me and Shane are, are big fans of talk sport. That's why we knew we knew you're on there. Um, yeah. But I, I remember like Adrian Durham was going. You think they bloody won it? But to us, we have we have won this. Yeah. Um, like like we've said before. I think when I went to Toulouse, there was um, it was like Little Wales. It was yeah. like there was so many Welsh who had touted tickets down there. But yeah. I didn't realise that half the caravan parks, they were just staying in, watching on their TVs. Yeah. It was like street parties. But we'd overtaken France. And I never realised how big France was until oh, I spent exactly. my months. Mate, <laughs> my mate Donovan said once, he was driving he was, he was driving along and he went, he said the funniest thing, he went, all right, France, you big bastard, stop showing off. <laughs> <laughs> you big bastard, stop showing off. Like three hours in, you know, we'd only gone like fucking halfway. He was like, come on. I was like, I know it's massive. But what was beautiful about stuff like that with France as well is when we drove from Lille to Lyon after the quarterfinal, Lille was obviously like Vachre weather, when it? it was like yes. rainy and grey. And then we get to Lyon, as we're driving through France, the temperature gauge outside is going up and up and up. And we get there, and it's like, it's like Mediterranean weather. So we were like, oh, we have to get shorts and things now, because we like, still had jeans on and jackets and stuff, you know. So France is the kind of country where you can drive from one part to another in the summer and have a completely different climate. <laughs> so it's amazing, you know, the way you could go. Well, in the sun now... So I, I, I just, I loved it. I loved it. Well, after the Slovakia game, like you said, I'm so happy. I remember <laughs> me, me and my buddy had borrowed this giant tent off my auntie and uncle. Because I, I don't need a tent. They were like, we got a tent for you. It's been up the attic for about 20 years. So we, <laughs> we set it up. We had a Welsh flag on it. I've got the photo and everything. So after the Slovakia game, we opened the wine. And all I can remember is the look on my mate's face. He was distraught. He kept staring at me going, how can you just sit there? And I was going like similar, you know. It's amazing what a day has been, you know, drinking the red wine. But it was pissing down in Bordeaux, and they hadn't put Scotch guard or nothing on the tent, so the tent was fucking flooding. And I'm just <laughs> sitting in, in a deck chair, happy as shit, because yeah, yeah, Wales have won, like, do you know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it's like, fucking hell. You can't write it, like, you know. No, it's it's when I went to Lille, I went with the, I went with the Merthyr boys, hardcore, and that, that was a great laugh. But I was like that to him. I said, well, look, wherever you're going to stay, boys, I said, I'll stay in the middle of town. You know, I'll stay in, in a decent hotel. They went, no, come on, son. You've got to spend it with the boys. And I was a bit like, oh, go on, I'll do it. I'll do it, Merthyr Hardcore. <laughs> Fuck me. They had those tin can places you see on motorways in Europe. They'd, they'd almost done like, like a metal weird hotel. Like there's one, there's one by Newport. You've got a Formula One, it's called, or something like that. They booked <laughs> one of them. And my room with my mate Alex, who was, who was booked there, was like, a, I, there was a hole. In the tent, where the fucking, you could see outside. 
And I was like, well, we can't leave nothing here. And the best most the reaction I went to go, oh, fucking shut up, Hollywood. Stop complaining. I've got you in a hotel room. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, there's a hole in the wall. You know, not that's for much. But let's have a wall complete. Be all right, man. And it was one of those ones, you know, where the, the toilet and the shower is hanging over the bed because it's so small. Like, you know, you're literally, you're having a shit and you can talk to them sitting on the edge of the bed. It's one of them. I was like, fucking hell, boy. But listen, it, it, I didn't care because we, when we beat Belgium, we all got drunk anyway and, and just didn't, you know. We, we were up all night on our phones watching the goals and... Yes, action, Robson you know. Carno's turn. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. all night. Lying on his bunk and he'd go, oh, look at this. You can see it from this angle. I was like, it's amazing. I was like, what time is it? He was like, four o'clock. And then we set off for, um, to, to the Leon. then in the early hours. Unbelievable. Just a great trip. Well, that was the thing yeah. with them because you were always on it, but then you'd have a 10-hour drive the next day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know, but the roads oh, are big out there and quiet, and it said you're all right. It's like, okay. like we we were super jealous of like Ronnie being out there for that long, and um, I remember I can't remember what game it was, Ron. I remember I saw you in the in the crowd, and yeah. I, I, I was watching the game on TV, and then I thought I was like. I'm sure I just saw Ronnie, like, and then you wind it, and then I paused it, and there's I Ronnie, t- top off. Top off. He's yeah. like, uh, and, I, and I just, like, screenshot it, sent it to her, I was like, ronnie oh. he's like, hey, what TV? Brilliant. Brilliant. And of course, he was, he, was, he was sending us messages, like, all the time, uh, where he's traveling and stuff, and he, he was just having the best time, and I was stuck in work, and I was like, I'm, I'm tamping. <laughs> um, I, I remember at one point we we just lost we lost the England game, and my mate as a cheer up I like going to Belgium and we were so close to the Belgian border he was like come on let's go and have some jupler and some uh, some chips down in the Grand Plaza so we, we went down there had your had your chips and stuff and then I got so drunk on jupler because I was so down from England the England match I remember ringing the boys and going boys get over here come on now come on it'll take you and i was mapping out in my head it'll only take about an hour come on you'll be over here now get on the plane and it was just one of those tournaments where you wanted everybody with you like you wanted yeah. and i think that's the the main thing like when you watch don't take me home it's like every moment you just wanted everyone that you love there you know yes. watch it you gotta watch it you know what i mean yeah. like that that dad moment like check this out come on now check this out don't matter if you like football or not because I think even, even the Portugal game, I was looking around the stadium like, fucking hell, people win daffodil at. That never yeah. happens normally oh, yeah, in a football like, game. It was rugby fans out there. Do you know, we were coming home one night in, um, I can't remember where we were in Lille, I think it was, it was a Belgium game. It's just because we were out there for two days before. And we were coming to a canal, right, in the moonlight. Uh, and it was like the French shows. And it, it looked exactly like something out of Band of Brothers. Do you know what I mean? Or Saving Private Ryan. And I was walking there like that. And as I spotted it, I just went like this. And all the boys got down, right, like this, and we took the canal, right? And we were like, oh, come on, kid, in the sign the rest of it. And when we finally took the canal, one of the boys, Flick, did it with a proper, like, roly poly and took it. I've taken it to Keyword. There was some French people watching from the window. They all clapped at the end. You know? it was just like ridiculous moments like that. We were all like pissed one o'clock in the morning. And we took the canal. It was just like, it was just like, it was an excuse just to be. Just to be like young, young and daft again, really, wouldn't it? Uh, you know, like, just do whatever you felt, and you just felt as well that everybody that was there had the same attitude. Everybody was just there for a party and a good time. The anthem in Bordeaux as well, Ronnie. Oh, uh, but I got it on my phone. Um, oh. and all you, I'm shaking with the phone because I'm crying. <laughs> I, I'm not ashamed to say that as a Welshman because I've said this to the boys and they respect it. I I was there when Wales could have gone to the World Cup and we missed the penalty against Romania yeah. uh, at, at the Arms Park. It's still a bit, I've got the programme still in my storage room by there. Um, and, I, and I just remember thinking, oh my God, one day we'll be in a tournament. Yeah. And I always watched my dad... Um, I'll get on to it in a second because a lovely segue because uh because of Cluffy. My dad was a Cluffy man. Um yeah. and I and, and he always watched England. I grew up watching England more than Wales, you know, your yeah. Gascoins, your Stuart Pierce missing the penalties, Gary Lineker in the, the World Cup. Um yeah. so to stand there off my own money and 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 watch my country play in, in a tournament, I was just bawling. I couldn't yeah. get through I was singing the anthem, I was singing the anthem like like it was the best. It was just the best moment ever. Like, and I'm yeah, sure yeah. I'm I'm there with hundreds of thousands of Welsh who know that experience because it was just like 
I don't know how it came across on TV. I remember ringing my wife afterwards going, did it sound amazing? Did it sound amazing? And my <laughs> my, my boy was saying, like, it was so loud, Dad. He was like, yeah. he was like the TV weren't out because my wife would turn it down. Fucking turn that down. But, <laughs> you know, my, my boy was saying it was so loud. The crowd was like, and we are a loud fan base. You know, we're, yeah. we're fantastic fans anyway. Like, Brilliant. you know, the Brilliant. songs are phenomenal. But, yeah, that Bordeaux. A Bordeaux oh. anthem, it'll live with me forever, but it'll um almost as good as the um oh fuck I'm having a mind blank. Um a couple of couple of months ago we did that that game and we started, we broke out into the anthem and, and we really scored. Good, it? Yes, it stopped. yeah, it's brilliant, wasn't it? Yes, they just let the fans sing it, didn't they? Didn't they yes, Catherine Jenkins and all of that bollocks. Let the fucking fans sing it. Do you know what I mean? Well, Great we can't... Idea. We can't yeah. fucking we can't sing it in time, but there's no point in bringing it with music. Exactly, no, I agree. <laughs> we find our own rhythm, find our own time, and then and it works so well, doesn't it? It does. It? We always laugh because um my my mate who comes to watch a foot, he's a drummer as well. We always laugh because we start with the best intentions, mine, and all of a sudden you can hear the echo in. It drives yeah, you nuts. It's the sing. Echo. It's the it echo. fucking drives you nuts as a singer because yeah. you want to coordinate everybody and you're like, fucking hell, everybody in time, man. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's the best someone... anthem. It is the best anthem in the world, don't it? And also, also, as a great interesting fact for you and the listeners, the first country in the world to sing an anthem before a sporting game was Wales against the All Blacks, I think 1906, where they did the hacker, and we responded by singing Mahir Nadvanade. First country to do it, and it became a thing then for countries to do it. We were the first ones to do that. Wow. Yeah, amazing. Wow. That? That I think is... that's why it's such a powerful thing for us to have before internationals, because it does mean something. A bit more, I think, especially in the football now. Like, you know, the, the FA, Welsh FA, say that it's become something in the game the players listen for and can give them that extra lift. It's yeah. astonishing, really, when you think of it. Yeah, and it's always at the right point as well, like, you know. And, yeah. and like I, I said it on another podcast, you always know when we respect the manager because, like, we always get him to, 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 to do either the A-taller or get him to yeah. clap. That's the yeah. Welsh one. You get him to clap, like, you know, give us a yeah. clap, give us a clap, give us a clap. And if they don't clap, like Giggs, he didn't clap before, they fucking booed him. Yeah. They booed him for ages. So it goes back to, <laughs> goes back to that Three Kings where the fan base almost demanded from the manager, like, do you know what I mean? We demand that patronism, like, do you know yeah. what I mean? That, yeah. that passion and Coleman, fair play to Coleman, carrying on from speed. It's, uh, yeah, I love it's, Cookie. Great. Yeah, phenomenal. Abs I was gutted when he went, but and I don't feel like that normally with managers, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. you, you felt a bond with that guy, like, you know what I mean? He, he was the bond, he was the glue, like, you know, it was... It was a brilliant time for, for any Welsh football fan that, that is. Like, you know, it's yeah. incredible. I do think we live in the, uh, I've said this quite a few times, we're living in the golden era of Welsh football at this moment because we've qualified for two tournaments out of three. We've never done that before. Got these great youngsters coming through, um, you know, so it's a wonderful time to be a Welsh football fan. You know, we should all enjoy it, do you know what I mean, as much as we possibly can because it might not last, but at the moment, it's just a great, great uh, Welsh FA is a dynamic for it to enjoy it. There's going to be no extra pressure like other countries put on their teams. We're happy to be there, but, you know, you never know. You never know. You never know, and the pressure's there now. It's almost like we expect to <laughs> wait. We're saying we never know, but we're always like, yeah, yeah, you could yeah, do yeah. it, boys. Yeah, I'm already going, oh, we could be Switzerland and Turkey. Yeah, Just we could get, can... get, get a point in Rome. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That's the thing when you start talking like that, like, you know, it's fucking. Like I touched on it then um, about Cluffy. Like I said, my old man was a very much, he was a Cluffy man. Um, yeah. I believe in miracles. Yeah. Yeah, that was the um, that was the film that did really well for me. Really, you know, you know, like you like like you were saying earlier on, boys, you got in the charts and stuff like that. When when you do a film that does well, they they wanted to make another one. Then do you mean they let you do another one? So that was the one that did. Um, I did it. I moved to Nottingham with my missus. Uh, my missus is Vicky McClure, the actress from Line of Duty, and this is England. Great girl. So we ended up living in Nottingham. It's a lovely city. Um, when I moved here, yeah, they found out some people who worked in the media area that I'd done some stuff in Wales and would I be interested in doing something. And I, remember, I got chatting about the great Nottingham Forest team of the late 70s, that amazing story of the way they won two European Cups in the Cluffy. And would I be interested in doing something for local television, it started. And I, I, I was about a week into it, putting some stuff together with music and things. And I was a bit like, I think there's something bigger here, in my opinion. And they were like, fine, I went, do you mind if I take you down to London? And played with some people, so I played what I'd cut together to Universal and Baby Cow, Steve Coogan's company, and they agreed, so they gave me the money to to make it. 
And then uh, when it came out, uh, it's five years ago now, so we're still in the glory days of, of DVD. It did 96,000 DVDs in the first four weeks. Astonishing. So I was like, well, so I, it was like the biggest grossing sports film at the UK box office in 2015. So it did really, really well, that film did. Um, and uh, it kind of set me on my way, really. Do you know what I mean? But terrific story. Um, great character, Clef. A bit like Steen, Shankly and Busby. And in some ways, even more interesting, Clef, because... He was kind of like he was a he was almost like a rock star, you know. It was a bit like yeah. he kind of he kind of like he, he was telegenic. He was he was a great front man. He could you know he was he was kind of rock and roll. He was he had attitude, and he was ultimately a genius that succumbed to alcoholism. You know, his son and his family speak up with this. You know, almost couldn't cope with it. But you know, just an amazing story because he was a great footballer, Cluffy as well. He's a great footballer. Yeah. Then he was a great manager. Um, and then a blessing, you know, that the alcoholism caught up with him and his best friend and him fell out, Peter Taylor. So he's an epic story, Clef, really, and a fascinating man. And, uh, a, a, you know, you say the word, you know, the word is used too lightly, these days, but a genius of a football manager. When he when he went to Forest in the mid-1970s at the age of 39, 40, I mean, he was, he was red hot at that point. I mean, he literally went to a mid-table second division provincial club, took them up, won the title, and then won two European Cups. It's extraordinary. Wow. Yeah, and you touched on it there, uh, him and Peter, the, the relationship, because obviously he used to find the players and Cluffy knew how to work them. Like he knew he'd always tell him what he needed, wouldn't he? And then Peter Taylor would, would go out and find that player, like, you know? Yeah. So I think that's when he struggled when he split because it was almost like a, a dis, disjoint, like, you know? Yeah, they suited each other brilliantly, really. You know, they were kind of like, they were, they were, they were, I mean, was, Clef was still brilliant when him and Taylor did split and, and achieved remarkable things, you know, but together they were, they were extraordinary, you know, they were just, uh, it was genius. Really. I'm always really interested with Clef as well, was that he played such progressive football, you know, when you, when you go back and you look at it, he, he was, he was all about passing it forward and he was compact and, you know, they were brilliant in Europe ahead of his time, really, in many respects, you know, the way he played football. And then would find players, you know, like John Robertson, who he turned into one of the best players in Europe, a little Scotsman on the wing, and just sort of said to him, I remember John Robertson was a great lad, actually, said to me, he said to me to just, he told me one little thing, and I was like, what did he tell you? And he went, he said to me, when you when the ball comes out from the back, turn side on at the, at the side of the pitch on the touchline. And he went, what do you mean? He went, show me your ass, put your ass in front of me in the dugout. And he was like, okay. And he said, he, just this one thing that he did, he said, I was able to see the ball then coming out, side on. And I knew then with a slight turn, I had to play it forward. So I wasn't facing that way when I had to turn completely. I was able to see both parts of the pitch. And Clef told him that. And he was like, that one little bit of advice changed my game. And I was like, that's incredible. And I think what I, th what I thought about Clef doing these films, and you, and you study these things in massive detail, Clef, Shankly, Steen, but what they had was they had remarkable knowledge of football. I mean, remarkable knowledge of football. But what they were able to do is they were able to distill that knowledge and communicate it simply and brilliantly to the players. And that is the key of great management, in my opinion. And that's what Klopp does. They don't overcomplicate. They're not on the side of the pitch. You know, see them now with folders and talk. What they were able to do is just give two or three succinct instructions and the players were able to carry them out and that's what made them a great team. Very similar to what Cook, um, Coleman said when he did in the uh, in the film about Don't Hit Me. He goes, it's their dressing room. I, they, they, they have a chat about the football. I tell them one or two things. And I think sometimes what I think is that's the key, great management, producing. I mean, I'm sure you've had it when you're in a band. Sometimes the simplicity is, is, is the genius in songwriting, those things. The things that come easy sometimes are the cleverest things. And I don't know what that is. But if you can find a way of channeling that, I think you've got a chance on it in anything that you do. Less is more. You, you can yeah. we we always have that ethic. While while you said about music, I couldn't let you go today without um the pocket devils. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, a Brit pop band from the um the mid nineties. Do you know what? At a time as well, when you only only you know, like somebody said to you, do you only hold that to hold a guitar up the right way to get signed in South Wales is like the height of the cool come come real yeah. that. Yeah, we um I kind of um, we I was playing in bands in the late eighties, early nineties, and then I was I was in this band called the Pocket Devils. What happened with us was in excess, who were a really big band at the time, yeah. the early nineties. They went on tour and was really good at them. This was they were massive then. When they went on tour, they picked local bands 
who were unsigned to support them. And brilliant, isn't it? And you were the only support as well. It wasn't like four down the bill. So in excess then picked us, we sent a demo in, and that got us a load of record company interest, you know, and uh, it was a great experience. And that kind of set us on our way then. We got like a deal with uh, Warner's Sanctuary, never charted in the top 40, which I think is what you've got to do really, do you know what I mean, to really get some momentum at that time. At that time. It was kind of like, in those days, I'm talking like 30 years ago now, you basically, uh, you got on certain radio stations, like a radio one on a playlist, and then you had like, it was only one or two shows. It was like, it was top of the pop still. You know, they had the chart show, show my age now. MTV was only two channels. I don't even think it was two channels. It might have been even one channel. So there was only a, a certain amount of areas you had to get into. And if you didn't crack it quite early, you were kind of like, it was difficult. You know what I mean? The enemy could be quite quite difficult and snobby to get into as well. So there was a kind of thing. We did all right, but uh, nothing like you boys. But I did enjoy being in a band. I wouldn't change any of it. I'm still great mates with the boys I was in a band with. You always have that bond with them. And I still see them whenever I go back to Merthyr. I'm still in a little group with them now on um, on oh, WhatsApp. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. And we always say, every so often, somebody will say well, every year or two, go, should we play again? And everybody goes, yeah. And I go, oh, boys, you know what I mean? We're all... <laughs> but it's just you know it, it's um it's an experience that i um that set me on my way really if i hadn't started in a band i definitely wouldn't have ended up um making films and doing radio and writing because i just think the performance in all the arts can be quite similar really you know getting on a stage and and, and you know entertaining and all that kind of stuff is is, is very much and i think a lot of it's to do with timing as well music film storytelling all that is to do with finding talent to say that the drummer especially but it is about timing and that you know what I mean? and getting that getting that in place you know what i mean is is do you hear that wrong it's all about timing I, 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 <laughs> I'm, still wrong. I'm still trying to learn i'm still i'm still in the 90s trying to learn now like well we we grew up around the same yeah. time we, we we got into bands when we were like 15 16 straight yeah. off into it where um like you said your stone roses broke um they broke and they were massive with and then obviously oasis followed and then nirvana yeah. that's that's what kind of co uh, cooked with us um, so you had that whole like indie mod and then you had the crossover of grunge along right. with your ride the lightning of Metallica's and you know what I mean? So we were in the washing machine of all that whilst yeah. listening back at the Beatles and yeah, the who yeah. uh, and, and anything, anything musical we listened to anyway. Like, so I was, I was really interested with that because obviously um, Sven Gali is, is yeah. there, did you play a lot of that off, like your experience of being in bands? Because it was just a few things where I was like, fucking hell, that's a bit close to all that is. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? It's like, it's a little bit. Like... I was in a band, you know, and I was a bit like, um, bands are bastards, you know what I mean? In a beautiful way, you know, and managers are like long suffering, you know what I mean? But usually in films, I wanted to flip it a bit, you know, where usually the managers, the, the conniving Svengali, but I wanted it to be a bit like what I remember, what we were like, you know, we used to those great things and those will make you laugh where you'd say to your manager, you know, we had a great manager, Dixie, it's based on him and go, you know, you'd go like, why how come we not on the front of the enemy? Why are Oasis there? You know, the, the obvious answer was at that time, Oasis were terrific and you're fucking in Merthyr. But he'd do that thing where he'd like, you know, uh, massage your ego and go, well, they loved your demo so much, they're going to wait to the next one, which they think will be even better. And then they'll put it in. Oh, yeah, I think it's yeah, do you know what I mean? It's like uh, everything just to smooth you, to keep you sort of like on side. Uh, you know what I mean? Brilliant. Well, so, so, there was so much comedy in, in rock and roll as well, in, in a great way. Because if, just for argument's sake, if Pete Doherty falls over in a pub, pissed, he gets, you know, he gets slowly brought around because he's a poet and he's a rock star. That's what he does. Whereas if you're an electrician, you get thrown out because you're a piss head, you know what I mean? So yes. you're forgiven, you're forgiven a lot in a band. I was in a band, I was very I'm talking about myself here. And I love that. And I love the fact that you know you are indulged and forgiven and, and you should be because you're the artist and everything relies on what you do. But it's a beautiful sort of world that you can um have have fun with. And I was able to do that with uh, with Sven Gardy, calling on my own experiences, do you know what I mean? It was a beautiful twist, and for anybody who's watching or they will be listening to this, um, with Svengali, the twist in it as well, I found normally when I watch music films or music documentaries or whatever, with this movie, you expect it to be like the manager's the bad guy. Because that's yeah. always the, the industry's the yeah. bad way. Where, like you said, Dixie, which I didn't know it was it was played off uh, off a mate or someone you knew, which is even yeah. more now. That's fucking fantastic for me. Um yeah. It's the fact that he is the nice guy. He is the yeah. guy, 
you know, I fucking love your band, boys. You're going to be massive. Yeah. And it's like, I love that because it's that whole, like you said, blowing smoke, but genuinely believing it. Yeah. And the band, the band not quite knowing how good they are and, and oh. up their ass and more concerned in fucking around rather than rehearsing. And yeah. you know what I mean? It's, and money as well. I used to be like, we used to be fucking terrible looking back. You know, I mean, we've, we've made it up with him now and we're great mates with Dixon he's, and he loves the film you know and he's he, he goes does Q and A's on the back of it and all sorts of stuff he's become a little bit of a sort of minor celebrity on the back of it but you know I used to, I used to be one of them as well this is, I'm talking like this is like ni- mid 90s I'd go I'd meet him and i go alright Dixon and he'd go oh yeah and i go I've got 20 quid for me and he'd go yeah and i go thanks <laughs> and some fans you know and fucking whatever pasty and that was just what I did, you know. I was just like, well, he's the manager, you know, he'd give me some money. It's ridiculous me looking back. I mean, he should have just gone fuck off, do you know? But it's a line, it's a line in a film, isn't it? Oh, Dicks, have we got any money? And it's yeah. like, oh, about three pounds seventy-eight. Can I have it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and just take it, just take it. That happened. That's what we used to be like. That is the, all the stories in it are absolutely true, you know. Pay and play. I mean, it's I don't know if it still exists, this dreadful thing in London where they'd go. They said, do Welsh bands. They, they, I mean, Kelly was a good mate of mine. They did him when he first started. We were talking about it last year. We made a pint together. I was going, do you remember when we first used to go to London in the early 90s? And they, they'd obviously hear the Welsh acts and they go, right, you know it's going to cost £200 to play here. Yeah? And we go, all right, save up because you play in London. And you got to bring a coach. See, we're getting your fucking mates. I was, and I was, uncles, you know. We've done it. We've done yeah. it. Me, me and yeah. Shane have talked about it on you. I, yeah. I'm not fucking joking. Covent Garden, Rock Garden, yeah. Nine, yeah. Nine, 1995. Um, 52-seater uh, Gwyn Jones coach from Brinketh in in Bridgend. <laughs> yeah. Pack, pack to the brim with fucking drinkers, let's be honest. Yeah, yeah. Drive, drive up there. Don't get paid. Fuck all. No. no <laughs> but you got play. there. We got yeah. there. They give us flyers. We had to go out and do the flyers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though we brought the coach load up, unbelievable. And the first one they do as well is they go, they get you the first one, they go, we'll give you a Saturday night. And you go, Saturday, we've got a Saturday night. Saturday. And then you get there, you go, the A&R, and they go, A&R men don't go out on the weekends, they do on the weekends. Oh. You fucking bastards, you didn't tell us that. Yeah. So then you ask for like a Wednesday night. But then you can't get the bus on Wednesday because it's work night. Your mates going, can't come, John, I'm, I'm working. So it's like you're always like, juggling all these things when you're a Welsh band. And then they do the classic. Would you move to London, boys? And I mean, it's bad. I mean, even them's the same. You're like, well, I can't move to London. It's going to cost us at least thousand pound for a deposit. I don't even know how we'd start. Like, do you know what I mean? It was just, it was we, a racket, really. We, it? we did it at sixteen, but and this is no joke because we got so many stories from it. I mean, like when you just said them, we I think one of the times we gone up to London, we took a fifty-two seater coach. We'd sold it as a, a trip to London. You know, like they would in school to the adult. Yeah. You get to go and see the go queen. Shopping, you want to go, go shopping. shopping. You get to see the fucking palace. Um, you get to go to Windsor Castle if you catch yeah. the tube or whatever. So we were just selling it as a day out in London. Plus, you get to come and see us at the end of the night. Like, come into the Royal Oak, but you're in fucking London. Yeah. London town, like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Where so we lives. Where yeah. Lives. <laughs> so we'd, we'd get our little laminated tickets, sell yeah. them off, pay for the coach and everything. And we'd still have to pay the promoter to fucking yeah. play, like you said, on a Saturday up in London. And we come away going, we met Ant and Deck. We never did. They bought, they walked fucking past us one night. I think we played um, in, in Trinity Club or Infinity Club or whatever it was called, Shane. Um, I can't remember the place. I can't remember and, the place. And fucking Ant and Deck walked past. And that was it for us. We were like, fucking Ant and Deck, are you? We've yeah. made it. We're in fucking yeah. London. We're in oh, London. Yeah. And the deck ain't gonna walk past up in fucking blah blah blah, are they? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And they we were played the garage once, straight the garage. And I, yeah, yeah. And it was a Sunday night. Uh, I don't know why we were in a Sunday night. Dixie said Dixie had managed to get like an A and R man to come. We've got to play this gig Sunday night. An A and R man coming. All right, get to get. We've got to run a bus. All right. So if on a Sunday we were struggling a bit, and I can remember we were pulling on the back to park and drop the gear off, which would be all the drums were on the on the coach. We got everybody to go on the one side of the bus so it looks full. The fella immediately went, You've just got everybody on the one side of the bus, you haven't got a bus full there. We were like, Ah, oh, you're not gonna let us play. And he went to bastard. He was like, I'll see you. I might have to move you down the bill now. I was like, Fuck you now. You know, they were like, they were they would torture you as well. And then the air armor didn't turn up. 
Didn't he turn yeah. up? Didn't he? Oh, he was out instead and something else. And he'd be like, oh, it didn't come. Oh, it was just... It was well, we crazy. always we always talk about when we were 17, I think 17, nearly 18, and we played Dr. Fox's Pepsi charts. Oh, fuck, you <laughs> know, we, we thought we made it, Johnny. We were like, yes, this is it. We were in, a, in an indie band with the next Stereophonics, but you look out, Kelly, we're fucking coming for you. And we did it. Everything was special about it. The place was packed when they shine, and we had our fans singing back the songs. And when we left, everyone went, I don't know how you ain't getting anywhere. And I was like, I forgot to phone a fucking record label. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> was like, we didn't. That was the only thing. We were so busy organizing coaches and rehearsing and being a band and, and doing all the promoting and that, that we forgot to fucking invite the record label down to come and see us. So it was like. Do you know, do you know how we got signed? I'm not, and this is not, I'm not making this up. I couldn't even put this in the, in the film. It's so ridiculous. We were called the Pocket Devils, right? And David Ambrose, who signed us, who, who was a really well-known a man, he was, he'd gone to Sanctuary to work, which was uh, owned by Warren. And he'd signed, like, fucking Duran Duran. He'd signed Blondie for the UK. He'd signed the Sex Pistols for AM. and He was a really famous a man. He rang us up, my old manager, Dixie, it's a true story, and went, I want to see the band. I want them to play a private gig for me in No Miss Studios. So we were like, oh, we've got a chance here. Um, and Paul, and our manager went, brilliant. Uh, you really like the men. He went, I am near them. I love the name. That's what he said. I like the name. So I knew this. I was like, fucking wow. So we go to London. We play the gig in the in Nomis, a private studio just for him. Finish the gig and he goes, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll uh, we'll, we'll sort, sort a deal out for you. And that was it. And I was like, it was almost like, and it was the complete opposite of what I expected it to be. Like coming off stage in a sweaty gig and somebody going, you know, you boys are the best band I've ever had <laughs> the doors. You know what I mean? I want to sign you. I want to be, you got a ticket. It was, it was the, it was the complete opposite. It was a bloke in the studio finishing and going, yeah, I think I can do something with that. So, you know, we'll have a chat. We'll, have, we'll speak to, we've got a lawyer. We were like, oh, yeah, fucking, you know, yeah. we well, need to get a lawyer and then, and then we can get where we are. And that, that was what we, so it was almost like, the opposite of what you expect. I got a brilliant fucking story for you. Our drummer loves this. He makes me say it because it obviously <laughs> makes me <laughs> just it. We played the hundred club, right? Yeah. We played the hundred. You know the hundred club. You go down the stairs. There's the, yeah. there's the, the little hatch, the cloak room. You go in. This the fucking hundred club. We play the gig, right? And some lots of gigs can be hit and miss. And sometimes you can think, oh, I played really well. And other times you think, no. Oh. We were we were good. We were fucking good. And you know when you're good, and you, you're three or four minutes in, you just go, we're, we're on it tonight. We're just on it. Bang bang. Play the gig and the crowd is brilliant with us. Like an indie moddy crowd. We're an indie mod, but fucking brilliant. So I finished the gig and I used to do this thing when we finished, right? Where <laughs> so I'm so wanky, you know. I'd, I'd leave first because I was the fucking front man. And then, and then the guitarist would play a little bit, like two minutes. The knobs. He'd walk off. The bass player would play with the drummer. Then he'd stop and then the drummer would drum and he'd stop and the lights would go out. Hey, fucking genius. So I saunter off. And I fucking go into the dressing room and I fucking everybody's patting me in the back. Oh, I was brilliant, mate. I fucking I, I spread myself out like a young Jim Morrison fucking sweat. And as I look up, there's a fucking really smart girl in the hatch and a mate. And I kind of look over and I go, Yes, girls. And she fucking hands me a coat. She's just come down the stairs. She thinks I'm the fucking coat check boy <laughs> taking the fucking coat. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is it a pound for the court? I'm like, fucking hell. It was the best bringing down a peg to ever in the history of fucking my life, I think. So, my drummer, the twat, he just walked in and seen it. He went, yeah. fucking, Mick Jagger, okay. fucking lead out in the settee, and she thinks he's the fucking court boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, though, hey, Ron, I like, I like the sound of that ending, though. Yeah. And there, off he goes, guitar yeah, is off he goes. One, one at a time. Know. The problem was, it would have been great if we'd have been, like, two albums in, you know, and two million sellers in net worth. The problem is we were trying to do it sometimes when we play in Wolverhampton to ten people, do you know what I mean? Like, we come off stage and it's fucking empty. The best of band playing Where's he going? I'm like, oh, we ended up there. At least we were trying. Oh, just great fun, you know I mean? Fucking great days, great laugh, great laugh. Ah, oh, oh, mate. Incredible. Brilliant story. <laughs> I know. Yeah, fucking hell. Uh, oh, so every time I go on Christmas, my drummer goes, John, tell him what happened at the end of the club. I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, oh, 
Brilliant. Brilliant. Johnny, thank you, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Brad. Oh, boys, it was an absolute pleasure. Could have stayed, all, could have stayed forever talking to you. I think it's brilliant. And, and genuinely, when everything kind of calms down, we do say it to people. We we will come with Ryan and we'll hook up and have a few beers. Um, and, and proper catch up, do you know what I mean? That'd, that'd be nice, I would like, you know. Thank yeah. you, for coming on. thank you for coming on properly. We'll buy you a few beers and stuff like that in a pub, yes. Um, and we'll we'll go old school and uh, and have a good chat, like, you know, that'd be fucking mint, I would admit. Brilliant, also, as well, if you can, you got my email address, and now, yeah, me, send me a song, I'll play a bit, I'll play a song for you on the talk sport show on Sunday. Oh, fucking hell, hell. yes, get some fucking, get some fucking loads of listeners as well. Talks, but it's mental, we you can't say anything on there without somebody going. I heard what you said. But one of our bucket lists is to go in there because um, old Hawksby and Jacobs, we listen yeah. to them and they yeah. always have like music artists in and I say to Sean, yeah. we'll we'll be in there yeah. soon fucking talking about Man United and Liverpool and do you know what I mean? So, and yeah. like Adrian Den Durham and I remember like giving Jason Cundy a load of shit after the Euros because he kept calling us the dog and duck and stuff like that. I was fucking, ooh, yeah. I was tamping. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it'd be lovely, honestly, to meet meet you in real life um, and I'll have a beer. And there's so many stories I, I I imagine you've got to tell us. Like, so it's fucking yeah, brilliant. Yeah, definitely. Right? We'll have a beer and like, send me a song. I'll get you on the show as well, boys. But it's brilliant what you're doing. I absolutely love it. So keep sure. it going. And like, same, next year, I'll, I'll come and see you play. Do you mean? I'll yes. Make sure I stand at the back of the stage. Too old now to be in the mosh pit, but yeah. No, I'll... you've got to be there when we come off, but there's <laughs> someone passing you a court. Yeah. <laughs> 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 spread out Nasetti. Spread out Nasetti like the A&R of our new label. Hey, boys. And we'll get, yeah. we'll get Ryan to pass you a court. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, I brilliant to meet you, but Incredible. and like I said, I I genuinely look forward to having a few beers with you. Honestly, now it's fucking. Well, boys, thank you so much, Cheers, boys. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh man, um, Mr. Johnny Owen, that's brilliant, but that's brilliant. Let's bring in the boys. We can talk to them straight away. That's uh, that's absolutely outstanding. It's Lloydo. It's Devo. Hello. <laughs> And it's Shina Boy. Hello. Hello. What's happening? Hey, boys, do you watch her? He's yeah. great, man. Great guest. Yeah, I mean, Sven Gali, I've got to wait on it, boys. If you haven't watched that, it's a music movie. Fucking had me rolling. I, yeah. I watched it years ago and I said to Shane, no, I'm going to rewatch it and stuff. So glad I did. There were so many little jokes that I missed when I first watched it. Um, and yet again, just related to it, like, you know, that. And, I'm so glad we had him on to chat to him because you had that whole, that insight to it. Now, I know it's made off. It's like us, and it? We all know mates um, or certain characters and stuff. So to fucking know he's going to made a movie <laughs> of someone he knows. Um, yeah. And honestly, yeah, when you I watch it, oh, Dave, honestly, when you watch it, it's brilliant. Because there's certain little bits for the carrier bag. Um, that Just the way <laughs> Yeah, honestly, it's that it's that fucking like well sing, you know, one of can boys, you, you know, little little like, things know, like in, uh, Glasgow Central Station of a fucking carrier yeah. <laughs> Exact. Yeah. See what I mean? Long yeah, exactly. long green long coat, long fucking bomber coat and all that. Like there's so many like you know, fucking tip offs and stuff like yeah. that. So in, in the coat, I forgot our crunchy. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but I mean, what a what a guest, boys! Just like, and I genuinely meant that. I I, I really want to sit down with him in a pub. It's about I don't know how many stories I couldn't tell him for the Euros. So I I look forward to that. Don't 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 take me home and and fucking when he said that about the band, I'm sure there's more stories he can probably tell us about oh. his life in a band and stuff as well. Yeah. And hundred percent. I, I think that's the quietest I've ever been on an interview. I was just I was just listening, man, just. It was great watching you both. So many, up. so many little things you can relate back to being a Welsh person. Like when he's yeah. when he's doing the Euros with his mates, and they're like, "Oh, come on, Hollywood!" You can imagine his mates. Yeah, going, yeah. yeah. So we, like, I saw we're Hollywood. like, yeah, just a tiny little bit, bit of success. You're doing Hollywood. well, hey, Hollywood boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he was so infectious, boys. Like you know, proper ad. He's exactly how we would be in the pub. That's what yeah. I loved about that, Shane. That was uh, yet an, uh, again another like crow cast where you feel like you're in the pub. Mm. Um, totally forgot, and I, I'm sorry I didn't bring up after the comments because you're so captivated by the stories. Um, yeah. And that's what we're like, especially in Wales, isn't we? When you're in a pub, it's almost like 
everybody's ravishing to get the bits in and hey, oh, hey, fucking, you know what I mean? Oh, you know him, do you? Oh, you fucking know that? And uh, amazing, like absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Like, yeah, I love that. Yeah, Shine up. Do you love um do you love all that about the three kings, Shine, all the Shankly and yeah, yeah. The, the, but the best bit for me was is you know, right at the end when he was talking about you know going to London. You know, <laughs> and he was, I was like, oh boys, this never ever do that again, <laughs> please. It's like, you know, are they getting oh, mistaken for the different, fucking different era, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah this. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you to all these people who come to watch us now on the side. Hmm. That's it, bro. Yeah. Into the corner. <laughs> yeah. It's an in industry where you have to take a, a coach, yeah, 52-seater bus or, or, or 100 and whatever, and you still have to either pay to play. Um, yeah. You do your set. You walk off the stage like rock stars to your local pub. Um and and that's it. You you're four hours back on the coach, but you've played mm. London. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. You've and and the worst thing back then. I, now I'm thinking about it. There's so many little things that you miss the tricks of. We would have played a gig, boys. We were sweating our asses off. Then we get then we have a drink on the bus for three and a half four hours, bogging because you haven't had a shower. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> remember, the, remember the seats on the bus? It was added cheap material, and it's so you're sweating. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's like. Like carpet, almost like cinema carpet on the seats, isn't it? Yeah, you get home. By the time you got home, you had a rash all up your back and up I your arm. wool, like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I keep trying to think of that place we played before the Pepsi charts. I was trying oh. to think the other day. And I, I got as far as Kaiser. I don't know why oh, Kaiser. No, 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 no. It wasn't it Cairo Jacks? Boom. Well done, but I've been trying to remember that for about... I don't know how many years. Do you know what I mean? That's brilliant. It's just, it's something in my story repertoire. Cause like I said, all these gigs were quirky and funny and we were, we were like detached from everyone. That's when we kind of went up on our own, wasn't it? That, that gig. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, mom and no mom and dads, no fucking. No one to bail you out. No, it was like, it was real. Like, Oh, we're up in a smoke. Now we're playing, you know, it was just, I don't know. It was, it was just, just I, mad. I remember the, the first London show I ever did was, um, they sent us tickets. It was back in the days of MySpace, and it was all through MySpace. They saw in the Purple Turtle in Camden. Um, we're going to send you like a, a ticket book of 50 tickets. I was like, yeah, yeah, cool. Knowing fully well, we ain't going to sell fucking one, <laughs> let alone 50. We've never played London. No one's heard of us, but yeah. we play in London. So just fucking lie. So it's just fucking <laughs> just blagging it. And it was actually with Don Brocco. Oh wow! Oh, wow! Um, wow! Really? Really? Yeah, that was the first time I ever played London. Purple Turtle oh, supporting stuff. Don Brocco, and it was about fucking ten people there really? on a Thursday evening. Wow. That's that's London, baby. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> but, like it. I yeah. wouldn't change it for the world. Yeah. Well, look at the crows, man, and I'm not ashamed. You always got to know where you, you you've been to 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 know where you've gone, like you know. And I think our first gigs up in London, it was straight up there, wasn't it? Let's get up London, let's do yeah. a gig. And you know, it'd be fucking 10 people. And I remember Jacko, whether he's watching tonight or he was been on before, he'd be one of them, like you know. Mm. And we just met him up there, you know, one of one of nine, ten people just watching us in fucking London. It was crazy, like, yeah, man. <laughs> I yeah. The laugh, that, that first gig, the first time we ever met him. I get off stage in the bar fly, wasn't it? He just comes up to me, goes, Great gig, hands me a fucking a pint of bud. I was like, Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> but I, who are you? But I'm gonna take. That. And, oh, I'll have a free drink. Yeah, there you are. But I'll take your drink. <laughs> but oh, no, that was up, that was up till quite recently. Do you know what I mean? Like you think about playing playing London for us we, two years ago. You know that was that was us, wasn't it? You know what I mean? And like it's mad to see how much we progressed. In in the, you know, yeah, that's mad, mad. Yeah, man. In, in yeah. a good way. Do you know what I mean? Like it's it's, it's crazy. Fantastic. It's absolutely yeah. fantastic. Fantastic. I think it's time. Is it? Oh, oh is it? It is. <laughs> Don't make it too hard, Shane, right? Else Let's out. do the gringos. Let's do the gringos. Tell me the lyric. Anyway. <laughs> 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 Tell me.
me the lyric, give me the lyric. What's the next lyric? Tell me the lyric, give me the lyric. What's in this lyric? It's lyric time. What's in this line? What's in this line? What's in this line? Right, this is going to be the fastest what's the next line ever. Are you ready? <laughs> Get sure. ready. In, baby. This is the easiest one we've ever done. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Get ready. Who said? Who said? Go. Which is a oh, perfect yeah. chance to switch gears and talk about this week. I know they're already on it. I don't even know. Is it even worth me even bringing up the next segment or are we already going to win <laughs> Someone said something. Yeah. Oh. We can answer, but I. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Let's come back to it after the next segment. Let's come yeah. back to it. Let's switch gears and yeah. let's move on to this week's Crow Radio. Crow Radio. Yeah, I'm going to have to do some sort of jingle. Yeah. Definitely. But sponsored by Uric then. Well, well done, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> this week's Crow Radio is football themed. Oof. Um, our guest this week and also... The Crows are back up and running with their football team. Uh, yes. So and we won, good. didn't we, Dave? We won. Sm smashed the fuck out of them last week. So, yes. What was the final score, Shane? Was it 22? It was, no, we went 26. I think they did. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I, I can't remember what they had, but we were, we battered them 26. Um, Let's give them 10, is it? Yeah, 10. 26 yeah. 10. So, yeah, I'm I'm not, not, not I know you're listening, head. Steve Harris. I know you're listening. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, yeah, anyway, Steve Harris is watching Dave, and he's he, I can tell he's he's fearful. He is when we when well, we, we play Iron Maiden, for any of his British line in the play. He watches every week, man. I know he watches every week. So, yeah, 26 10. The Crows are back. So, football is it, Dave? Yeah, football theme this week. Um, you're probably expecting loads of like three lions and all the rest of it. Well. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so, first song, Kick Out the Jams by MC5. Kick, get it. Next song, Fight for Your Right, Beastie Boys. Kick it! Get it. That was my <laughs> choice. I was, I, was proud, and I was proud of that. <laughs> I was so proud of that. <laughs> Alive and Kick In, Simple Minds. A lot of kicking theme in Theme I team, remember but... that. I'm I'm sorry to, to butt in. Alive and kicking was always the Premier League when we were when yeah. we were, when we were kids. Such yeah. a tune, man. I That's why Van had to go in there. Thing. And we were on about like um and uh what we were on about the other day. Um Ma 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 was it Martin fucking hell, I've forgotten now. Andy Gray? Is it Andy Gray and uh, Martin, no, uh, Martin uh, uh, Richard Keys? Old fucking gorilla hands. Yeah. <laughs> Richard yeah. Keys. I, I was listening to that um, tune, our, 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 our playlist, and that's I thought it was heavier than that, but it's really not, is it? It's not heavy at all, that song. Well, I even kick it. No, it's like... No, but it seemed that when we were kids, it'd be like... No. La, 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 la. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great song, man. Great song. Brilliant song, but it's really yeah. it's really light and kind of poppy. It's mm, not yeah, heavy as I it thought. Is, yeah. Brilliant. I, imagine, I, love it. I don't know why. I listened it back to it, but it was, yeah. No, I still it, I still kind of play that in the car now and again. I play it a lot. Man. I, I play it a lot. Yes. Anyway, move it on. Move it on. Oh, sorry, Dave. There we are. <laughs> we are the champions, Queen. You might have heard it in the stands. Seven Nation Army, again, you might have heard it in the old stands. You'll never walk alone. Um you did it in the stands. If you're, if you're a scumbag, you might have heard it in the stands. Oh, oh, watch it, fucking church up. Can I, play with, <laughs> can I play with Madness? Can I play with Madness by Maiden? Now, that's a tip-off to our old mate, our old um, regular listener, Steve. Steve-o! <laughs> <laughs> Next song, Kickstart My Heart, Motley Crue. Can't take my eyes off you. Frankie Valley. Daydream Believer by The Monkees. I'm not sure if they wrote that one. Uh, you Are My Sunshine. Johnny Cash. Kicking and screaming, funeral for friends. Got nothing to do with our affiliation with the band or being friends of ours in any way whatsoever. The name Kick is in the title. <laughs> <laughs> this next I'm one. Kicking. You did it in the stands. <laughs> this next one. 
is the best song on the playlist. That's my goal. Shane Ward. <laughs> 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 Who's fucking choice? I missed all the messages about that. The, the that really, yeah? like, I can't remember, but... I... That was Mate, my... I got... Yeah, I think that was our fucking... I'll give you. I'll give everyone. I'll give you his email address, everyone, so you can complain about that one. Uh, Next seasons, waiting on you, future islands, uh, Ocean Avenue, yellow card, the winner takes it all by Abba. Yes, <laughs> champion, that, Fallout Boy, and t- this this made me laugh. This title, the <laughs> Defender, Man of War. Just because it says <laughs> Defender, <laughs> so some. Again, very, very, very varied. To be fair, looking at that, the only good songs are the first three, four, and then it just goes downhill after that. <laughs> it's fucking great, man. All football themed in the stands, kick in, all the rest of it. So enjoy, everyone. Oh, I loved enjoy. it, mate. And um, I, I tell you what I've been singing in my head all week as well, but I didn't want to put it on the playlist, was the... the do you remember the Tampax advert? It's my life. <laughs> I... <laughs> I don't know My why. I one. don't know why. Yes, I don't know why. But when some of the names you were suggesting and they were going in there, I kind of went back to my my youth and that advert came on. And I don't know why I thought that it was associated with football. I was thinking, what's that song associated with football? That's how we started this week. And I'm going, it's my life. And in the end, I Googled it. I was like, it's the fucking Tampax advert. It's nothing to do with like soccer AM or bloody or match of the day. It's freaking, do you know what I mean? So there we are. Music and it's implanted in your brain. Like, mm, and that was no Tampax is. Thanks. Yeah. You're very welcome, Dave. In the stands. <laughs> in the it's stands, lads. It just like this little tickle. It's tickling me going fucking shine there. You fucking watch it to a chill. <laughs> Sack him, Shane. Sack him. So I, that, I, that I is all available on our uh, Crow Radio. Ah, Beaky. Misconception that Kerry King played a solo on um, uh, the Beastie Boys track. It's a misconception is not Kerry King. Did you know? You asked him. You <laughs> yeah, I mean, Kez, like... <laughs> Apparently, yeah. no. all all available on our uh, crow crow radio playlist, uh, which you can get on on Spotify. A lot of great feedback from last week with the know your crow, um, and of course the fan the the fan crow radio as well. So yeah. check check this one out. Like I said, it might be football related, but there are some bangers on there, absolute yeah. bangers. Mm. Tunes. Have we got a winner, Shano? Shane Ward, though. Shane Ward. That's not a <laughs> <laughs> That's got brilliant. It's got to come um, off, yes, yeah. we well, a lot of people you could tell were like waiting by their keypads to or mobile phones to text this in, but a lot of people said the wrong yeah. lyric. So it's um who said rock and roll's dead? But a lot of people um <laughs> uh, rock and roll ain't dead, rolling. rock <laughs> yeah. The, the title of the song, Rock and Roll is Dead. Yeah, I would have done that. I would probably would have done that. <laughs> um, there were a couple of people that said it first, but they have one recently. So, again, guys, do you mind if we pass on to someone who hasn't? And there was one on um, YouTube. And then when I looked, it's got me. The, 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 there's someone on Facebook whose birthday it is that we've already said it's her birthday. And I, I, can't, I can't overlook her. It's her birthday, man. So we're going to give one to Pete Evans on YouTube and one to Angie Parrish. This is her birthday on Thursday. Hey, well done, guys. Well done. Tell us what you want from the uh, website and we'll get that guys out to you guys. Well done, everybody. Well done, everybody. And shame well on done. the next time for getting it wrong. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was like an old Bruce Lee movie then with, with your latencies. Like, <laughs> yeah, I should have Shifting gears. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, here we are. 
Shifting. So, so I suppose. <laughs> yeah. So I suppose. The first, so I suppose the first question this week is: Has Dave got trousers on? No comment, Your Honour. No. Ooh. Yeah. Because he didn't, Stand boys, up. did he? Mm. Stand up. I rarely wear trousers. So what's been going on in China, boy? <laughs> nice trousers. Um, well, 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 Boris has started his own crowdcast, didn't he? Have you seen him this week on, on the telly, like? Aye. In, yeah. in the House of Commons on the telly. Oh, Bosscast, yeah. like. Oh, Bosscast. Yes. Yeah. So I thought, oh, I wonder where you got that idea from, Boris. <laughs> Bosscast. Mm. <laughs> so. Is it called Bosscast? No. <laughs> no. No. That's be amazing. Charging him for that. Yeah. So yeah, what well, what well, well, what else have happened? Oh, some some woman has been fired, and she from number ten, like, or whatever she done. Do we have a name? <clears throat> no, I can't remember. The only woman that works there, probably. <laughs> Fire the fucker, like. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Are we getting closer to having a drink with our loved ones? Are we getting are we getting closer? Well, well that's you, what I really want to know. Well, here we go. I got I got you know, we got the new Oxford keyword and we yesterday. So in you know, in classic uh yeah British tra- tradition, ours <laughs> only works 70% of the time. But if you give mm. her a little more dosage, it works 90. Always cutting corners and what? Yep, definitely <laughs> cutting cutting corners. Uh, well, the the, yeah. um, the uh, rules will be laid out for Christmas, haven't they? So apparently, up to three households can get together. Yeah, if if you read between the lines of that one, it's basically for three days, do what the fuck you want. Yeah, is it? Yeah, and then it's set for the consequences <laughs> in January. Have you you said <laughs> yeah. I heard it yeah. from you, Shane. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Shane Minster. So if I have well, the old Bill knocking yeah. on the door. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's all right, China. He said it's fine. It's, it, yeah, and, uh, China, you know, I, you know? <laughs> yeah. Do we want for three I days? Will, I, I will do Glett like all good prime ministers do. It wasn't me; it was Dave. <laughs> so <laughs> I just, I just show my pants again. It'll just solve everything. Exactly. Are you Dave, in your Dave, pants? Dave, 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 yeah. yeah. Are you in your pants, Dave? Of course, I'm in my pants. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. I'm going to watch his arms throughout this show, start pulling them down slowly. <laughs> Comedy <laughs> fact. Have you noticed my t shirt as well? Yeah. Oh. Oh, look at it that. Had to be done. Had to be done. Had to be done. It doesn't fit me anymore, but it had to be done. <laughs> so, not not a great lot. Not Nothing that you're happy with this weekend, Shine, no? No, I, I, I will be pleasantly happy, boys, when they vaccinated the entire world and we can go back to normal. Yeah. And just simply because, so we can play. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not also, taking a vaccine, no, but I'm not taking it. Well, no, well, no, here's the thing with the vaccine, right? right? They, they were saying something yesterday, so they're going to vaccinate, you know, the people who are most vulnerable, you know, the ones who are more likely to die from it. And yeah. then basically they're going to go, on you go. And then if you yeah. catch it bad, then they'll vaccinate it. That's hmm. what they're going to do. Hmm. Vaccinate so. the vulnerable people and then let the rest of us get on with it. Do you know what I mean? And, yeah. and, and all right, you get a bit ill and, you know, one in a million dies, you know, because it does happen. But still got to get on with your lives and you can't just go in and out of lockdowns for the next 20 years, can you? And that's why you're second in command, David. Well done. Exactly. There we go. Love it. Love it. Moving on. That was your Shine Minister and David Winchurchill. And now let's give something away. Give it away, give it away now. Give it away, give it away, give it away now. Give it away, give it away, give it away now. Oh, I was waiting for the bass line to kick in. Not giving them royalties, son. <laughs> I have had enough of James Brown, so I ain't having the chili peppers on my hit list. Robin, yeah, absolutely. 
So this week on Crow Wheel, we have got um, the wonderful Catherine from Cornwall Rock Box. Um, she basically does these. Look, if uh, Ronnie can get the clip up, look at this. She makes these frames out of pebbles. Stunning. Ah, the frames out of pebbles, awesome. or what's in them? Eleven. And basically, you can put any lyric you want in these frames, but this, this, that's quite a poignant one. You got to hit the lows to feel the highs, baby. Who uh, said? So that's that's from Catherine um, from Corn. Well, rocks box that's the prize one of the crow family thank you so much catherine and here we go who's gonna win who's gonna be this wheel is getting a lot of names on it now it's grading every week it's loaded it's stacked half of it's still me you know that it's piles of it isn't it dan and fellows what a lucky fellow tiny well done darren Congratulations, Sarah, and send us your address. Lucky fellow. To the lovely Catherine. Thank you so much, Catherine. Awesome, Darren. That's awesome. Amazing, amazing prize. It is. Now it's your moment. That bit gets me every time. <laughs> Elvis was blonde. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's a good one. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Elvis was blonde. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> He's been practicing that all day. <laughs> You're the laugh. Damn it. Ah. Trust me out, motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, no, Elvis was a blondie, man. He dyed his hair because it just looked better on cameras. And yeah, he's a blonde. Fucking blonde motherfucker. Marilyn Monroe was brunette. There we are, see? What a bunch of fucking Ooh. fakes. You wow. Think fake, you think fake's a new thing, people? It fucking ain't. Kermit the Frog was green. Wow, that's because, that's because he drank too much. He went on a coach to London with you boys. <laughs> Oi, did you go on? Did you know that McDonald's created bubblegum flavored broccoli? Yeah, no, I knew that one. <coughs> I skipped but... over that because it's a shit fact. Next, <laughs> <laughs> did you know that Dave is mental? <laughs> <laughs> True. True, true. I can see true product. Yep, true, 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 true. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. true, true, true. Oh, the fucking, the fucking, it's, going, it's blowing up. True, 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 true. <laughs> it's because we totally tripled on him, man. Go on, Lloyd, have you got one? Oh. <laughs> I can see Dave like a fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Lloyd. Hit me, baby. I don't know. My mind's gone blank. I'm just flabbergasted by the shit that comes out of your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Elvis was blonde. <laughs> He's a fucking blondie. That's incredible. Picture That's Lloyd incredible. with a quiff. <laughs> Hang on. Shine, how do you how do you use you usually do it like Cove flick over, it over, man? <laughs> yeah. Uh, That's him. Yeah, give us the old uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Oh, okay. go get the blue suede shoes, love. <laughs> love. <laughs> so like, like, What's that? It's like oh, Tom Jones. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Phoenix Heights. Do you know anything else? All right. Blue suede shoe. Blue suede shoe. There we are. There we are. See, I'm getting some confirmation. You are actually. Yeah. He's a blue ad boy, so it could be true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know why I did that accent. It worked better on camera, apparently. The contrast between the, the blue eyes and the, and the brown hair. And wow. also James Dean was the was the blonde boy around that point, so it would have been a bit of a you know. Yeah, it's very much like any industry, and if they look a certain way, oh you gotta look like that, or mm-hmm. so I can I can believe that. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, man. Elvis blonde, definitely true. Mm. I love it. Mm-hmm. Do you wanna okay. do you wanna hit us with one more before we move on, Dave? Seeing uh, as we all uh Give me the theme tune and I'll get my little list of. Oh, oh, I'll give you a great theme tune. <laughs> <laughs> quick, theme tune, theme tune. Quick, 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 quick. You need quick, a theme quick. tune. Can't you just give facts? Like, you know, if you put a grape in a microwave, it'll catch fire. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, 
if you flick a nipple for seven seconds, it will become hard. Any nipple. Flick your nipple for seven seconds. <laughs> no, it did work. It did work. Oh, Open the window and do it, Dave. Then it'll it get work. hard. Oh, God. Get the cold air in, son. <laughs> no, it was like, you know, this is why this part of the show is very visual and, and YouTube-based, but it's the fact that we just stayed on the camera and went, did you know you could do it for seven seconds? <laughs> starts aggressively flicking his nipple like. Everyone's <laughs> flicking their nipples now. I've got that kind of power over everyone. Thank you very much. And good night. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I, think, I think there's a delay though, Dave. I think there's, there may be truth in that. Like it wasn't after the seventh flick, but now I've left them. Now, now they're wrecked. Oh, yeah. Ooh, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, and, uh, and a fact, he didn't actually do seven seconds. He just kind of did six, six yeah. flicks. So if you're truly yeah. going to do seven seconds, you would count to seven whilst flicking your. Are you yeah, right, that's what I found. Remember that band <laughs> called Seven Seconds? Maybe that was what it was about. Yeah. Comes after. <laughs> it's, like, like, it's like the Viagra effect. You take it and it comes after. <laughs> well, apparently with Viagra, you said that joke. Like... <laughs> <laughs> As you were talking, no, it's weird. It's weird. Well, I couldn't stop. Both, Dave, like a... I couldn't stop. <laughs> couldn't stop watching Dave. He's going like a... oh. <laughs> we need we need to know if any of the crow family are flicking nipples right now and is it is it true there you go nipple flicking does that work for willies too uh, <laughs> <laughs> try it uh, we're, we're back on there <laughs> try it that was the opposite effect for willie isn't it go on dave have a go back <laughs> oh. oh god how do we end up here 36 weeks and we're flicking nipples. <laughs> yes. Pinnacle. This is the pinnacle. Oh, fuck it now. It's Those incredible. <laughs> when we do do a, a best of, there's going to be accents by cows and flicking nipples. <laughs> <laughs> be flicking cows' nipples next week. Oh, fuck it now. We used to be in a, we used to be in a rock band, boys. A hard rock band. We're flicking nipples. <laughs> no, days in a hard cock band. <laughs> <laughs> Hard cocks and hard nipples. Uh, we roll? That's incredible. Yeah. Well, that, that was Dave's fun fact anyway. So let's... <laughs> I think after that, we're going to have to give something away, Shane. We definitely... Uh, Another crow wheel, I think. I think we did this one away. I think it was called Dignity. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's try and make up for it. Give something away. Right. Off you go. Here we go. Anything you want off the website. Who's gonna nipple, be? Who's gonna nipple be? clamp. Crow's nipple clamps next week. It's, it's, it's... <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake! <laughs> no way! No way! Stephen Winters! Oh, Stephen! Yeah. Stephen Amos! Oh, fucking hell! Steve! Oh, great! Well done. well done! Good prize, that. Slamming. Any uh, any last orders, boys? Any questions? Anything that we haven't covered? Anything you would like to to state before we leave? Yeah, uh, Dave's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> the the men in the white coats who round an offer were Dave. Just have a text be, off them. Bitchy's be crazy, isn't it? Exactly. I, I will start by saying uh, a massive thank you to Johnny for coming on tonight. Um, Real, real enjoyment in my household. Um, watching his movies the last couple of days has been great. Yeah, um, fantastic stories from a guy that I can't wait to actually meet in real life. So, genuinely, uh, I'd like to thank him for coming on. And I would like to urge anybody who's into football to go and check out um, The Three Kings. It's out now, it's available right now. You can go onto Amazon, you can stream it. 
um so it's it's all there incredible like i said the story is amazing a lot of things i didn't know as a football fan um for anybody who wants to catch him he's on talk sport this week and he did say he'll be playing a crow's track yeah, so uh, you know for those who listen to talk sport or who will hear the audio bite make make sure that you give him a cheeky tweet saying how much you loved during the crows on talk sport um and how you'd love us to go on there maybe that'd be that'd be what, loads uh, of fun that would what song are we gonna send him? Ooh, that's that's uh all of them. Make he make his mind up, Emily. It's a tricky one, see, because I always said, Oh, I don't know. I always said gone in a blink of an eye is always that when that when a when a, when a team loses. Do you know what I mean? I, I always said it was written for that, like on a sky when um when it's that moment you've just lost the fucking cup or something or the match or um I don't know. But what any any you would do, Shane, or um, no, I, don't know. I was just wondering, like, if any of the Crow family wanted to, like, put one. Probably, uh, go on, fuck it, going down then because of uh, Man United on um on the weekend. <laughs> but, but we beat you, Dave. Yeah, yeah, we we know in what manner that came about. But we beat you. We sang one of the best players you can sign, Var. He's incredible. It's, Good old Var. Like, like <laughs> I, I, I thought that Ollie Amy actually, Ollie did the best fucking strategy that he has done all season is by using Var. It was, it was incredible. Bring it's, him it's, on it's, the last the minute. Whole, like. Well, the whole play that led up to Var, you know, basically captivated in the fucking game. He, he was the, he was the difference between two teams. Var. He was incredible. He was. He was. So uh, yeah, get embarrassed. You can't beat a team of shit as mine, you know, more than one goal by a decision that was illegal. It's been embarrassing, isn't it? When you think about it, am I right, Shane? I, I wouldn't actually put your team down <clears> unless you <throat> didn't watch them. I actually thought West Brom turned up and they were really, yeah. really good. Oh, they but, did. They just but it depends if you were a sofa sofa watcher and you didn't watch it, and like you you are now blagging it and pretending yeah, you watched like the me. match. Yeah, definitely. You, yeah, <laughs> like most of my life, mate. West Brom actually turned up. They were really good, but Man United were very, very poor. So, but it was a good. I, I think everybody underestimated West Brom on the weekend. They they did mm. fucking really well. They were well together. They came. They were up for it. Um, it was a game of two halves. See, Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> got a brilliant youth side. Youth side coming up. Brilliant uh, youth side. Yes, great goals. I didn't, I, I didn't expect that response, Ronnie. Well, Les, Les Diamond would be very proud. Yeah, um, there's loads of loads of suggestions yeah. here. Um, Kingdom of Dust, Send the Reaper, Never Win, Who Did It, Go Get It is quite po popular. Uh, what was that? Go Get a Football Anthem right there. Um, go Get It, Go Get It, Blink or Damn. Kingdom of Dust, that's coming up quite a lot as well, isn't it? Kingdom of Dust. Um, just say the full album of Point of No Return. I mean, we could. We could. We could. That's great. So, yeah, um, hopefully that happens. Uh, that'd be incredible. But either way, um, <coughs> massive thank you to Johnny Owen for coming on. Um, and, yeah, guys, before we go, if you can go and subscribe or like the post, share them everywhere, tell everybody about Crowcast. It will be turning audible as well over the next couple of weeks. So make sure you like it on Spotify and spread the word. Um, any other business, boys? All good? Over to you, Shiner. Love it. Ladies and gentlemen. One liner, Shiner, Shiner, Shiner. Shiner, 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 Shiner. <laughs> Nice. Uh, <laughs> I, I got a nice one tonight, guys, to play, to play with your mind. Right. right. Here we go. So here we go. Believe nothing. Unless it agrees agrees with your own reason. Okay. I, I pinched that one from Buddha. Oh. Hell of a boy. Unless it agrees with yeah. reason. I don't understand what it means, but I thought, oh, that sounds cool. Mm. Oh, I like that, but I like that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well done. So that's it, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on episode 36. We will see you next week, Tuesday, 9 o'clock. See you then. Peace. See you.